That's the one thing about our audience. They always want a new guy to break through the glass ceiling. And all you have to do is just be real. Allow me to reintroduce myself. I am the jabroni beating, pie eating, trail blazing, eyebrow raising, talking is done, you're out of your class, no sleep till Brooklyn, the rock whips your ass. Woo! I wish you and King would quit talking. All right, welcome to Around the Ring, episode number 63. It is Sunday, September 11th, 2016. I'm your host, Dave Brown. I'm joined by my new co-host, Floyd Johnson. Floyd, how you doing, sir? I am doing well. Excellent. I'm looking forward to being on the show. Yes, thank you so much for, for coming on the show. It's me just talking to myself after a while gets real boring. So I, I appreciate you uh, you coming on and joining us. And now you are a lifelong wrestling fan, is that correct? Yes, um, I don't remember a time, I'm 35, and I don't remember a time that wrestling wasn't a part of my life. Uh, what are some of your earliest wrestling like memories? The first match I remember is, um, it was the David Von Erich Classic. It was Ric Flair versus Kerry Von Erich, and Kerry Von Erich won the title with a roll-up. I remember that because my brother... Big Ric Flair fan, big Hill fan, and it, when they put Kerry Von Erich over, he just couldn't believe it. That was that's a great match. That uh, yeah, it was it was like a pin out of nowhere. It was like a, not a yeah. yeah, it was I forget how it was one of those so backslide backslide. Yeah, that was it. And but then I mean he held the belt for like a week. Yeah. The, yeah. the NWA back then was really bad about about taking the belt off Flair, giving it to somebody for a few days, and then putting it back on Flair, and. <laughs> They did it for Fritz. He was, you know, they were kind of like, hey, uh, they were building David up to be the champion. And that happened. So uh, pretty much they kind of gave Fritz, gave Kerry the belt as an honorary thing to Fritz. Yeah, I can see it. And Kerry, what what was sad is I think Kerry Von Erich is one of those guys. Had things just gone a little bit differently, he could have been such a huge star. He looked phenomenal, especially for the time. Very, I mean, his look now is commonplace in wrestling, but mm-hmm. at the time, there were very few guys that were you know that good looking, that jacked, and that could move the way he could. I mean, hell, you think about his entire run in WWE, he had one foot. Yeah. And when I go back, I I went back a few years ago and watched that Mr. Perfect match, and it's just like you can't tell that he was on a stub. I mean, and it had to be painful. So it's just like he would work, and he worked well. I mean, he probably wasn't as agile, but I don't, you know, but I could not tell the difference, and I just, it made my respect for him go way up. Yeah. Same, same here. He, uh, he, he was a hell of a talent. It was. I always thought it was kind of a shame that he never m- moved higher in the WWE or WWF at the time than he did. I mean, granted, there were a lot of guys at the time that were at that Intercontinental title level, which for newer fans, they don't realize that how much more important that belt was back then. Yes. And uh, because, you know, Hogan had that stranglehold on the world title. And uh, so there was that whole mess. Um, and I loved Hogan at the time. I'm not, you know, at the time he was he was amazing. Uh, but even that having been said, I did prefer the four horsemen. I really did. So as a kid, what what did you what did you watch? Oh, uh, as a kid, of course, being from Oklahoma, I watched Mid-South. They had a weekly program until they went to, like, UWF. I watched uh, WWF Superstars, and then whenever they did Saturday Night Main Event, I usually didn't get to, like, pay-per-views like WrestleMania and stuff until three months after, three, six months after when it came out on VHS, we would rent it. Uh, WCW, or, yeah, WCW or NWA, I think I go all the way back to Georgia Championship Wrestling. Oh, wow. As it as it kept switching on TBS, and um, uh, I watched a lot of that Clash of the Champions. Um, I mean, two out of three falls, Ricky Steamboat and Ric Flair. Oh um, yeah, that was still still one of my favorite matches to this day. Um, I, you, I, I could watch Ric Flair and Ricky Steamboat work at any time together. They were just to me like perfect together. 
And, uh, yeah, so my brother, again, he's 10 years older than me, so he was a heel guy. So, of course, I was raised a heel guy. So <laughs> I, always, I always went for the heels in WCW. And then in WWF, I was more of an Ultimate Warrior fan. Okay. Very yeah. nice, yeah. Yeah, the heels, I, I think that WWF never, especially back then, the character dynamic outside of, say, Roddy Piper, um, I mean, the characters were pretty, they were caricatures, and uh, they were cartoon characters, really, and it was, I'm a bad guy, I, I'm going to beat you up kind of thing, but you would get into Crockett, and into, you know, World Class, and in UWF, and all those other places, and the heels were so much, there was so much more to them. And I think that's why eventually it just got to the point, no matter how bad Flair and the Horsemen were, they would get cheered. It, it, the thing was with me was the Hills, the, they had the factions, the groups or whatever, they seemed to have each other's back. When Ric Flair was getting beat up, you know, Arn Anderson, Tully, they wouldn't be far behind. But you would always see Sting or Lex Luger or whatever, getting beat up by all four of them and no one would run out. Now, of course, not knowing it was scripted back then, I just thought the good guys were like wusses. I'm like, why don't they have their guys, why don't they have their guys back? And it yeah. was just like, it, it, they just never came out. It just seemed like the bad guys were more loyal to each other. Yeah, I, you know what, you, you nailed it. And with the exception, I think Sting was one of the few guys who would constantly run out to help people. Yes, uh, and uh, you, especially you look at a guy like Hogan. When Hogan would get beat down, you know, say when when he fought King Kong Bundy at WrestleMania two, at the build yeah. up to that that Saturday Night main event when Bundy um, beat him up and you know cracked his ribs, and then the British Bulldogs came out to save him. Have you ever seen Hogan go out to save somebody unless there's an you know it's an opportune moment for him, like yeah. when he quote-unquote, saved Bret Hart from Yokozuna just so he could get the belt? Yeah. I, I, I said the same thing about John Cena. I was like, if John Cena would never be my actual friend because, you know, when Zack Ryder was doing the little with the people's champion type thing and they were really trying to push him, mm -hmm. and then he comes out and helps John Cena and, you know, they're trying to give him the rub, but Zack Ryder kept getting beat up by Kane and everybody after that, and John Cena never ran out to help him. I was like, yeah. I would hate to be John Cena's friend. <laughs> John Cena just comes off like a dick, man. Yeah. He, yeah. I mean, he says all the, you know, never give up and all that stuff, but he has no one's back. Yeah. Ever. And it's, it's really, I mean, you're right. It makes you, you look at heels, and especially heel teams, and they always are defending each other. And you look at some of these these ultimate baby faces, your your Hogan's in his prime, uh, John Cena, pretty much forever, and they don't have anyone's back. Yeah, and, and what's what's the sub um, the subliminal message that's sending? Yeah, and, and I I've always said it. I'm like, it looks like it looks like the writers or the writers or anything. Of course, they're trying to build up this person for everyone to get behind them. But the subliminal message is very much that, you know, bad guys, they're actually more fun and they generally are more loyal. Yeah, you're right. You're right. And there's also the other subliminal message. Only watch out for yourself. Exactly. Yeah. Which is bad. That is not good. Kids don't do that. <laughs> so uh, of, of all, of the the different organizations you've watched over the years, do you have a favorite? Do you um, consider yourself a you know an ex guy or whatever? I am uh, pretty much a WCW guy. I was that WCW with the cruiserweight division. I just I just always thought it was pure wrestling, and there was enough. It was enough storyline uh, to keep. You know, someone that's not a pure wrestling fan interested, but I mean, the belt was the big uh, was the big amount. Like in WWF, they kept the belt on Hogan so long they had to focus on so much other things because they they didn't want you looking at the fact that your world champion's been the same for four years. Yeah, you know, you like your world your world title can't be the most important belt because the other guy holds it so long. You know, so you had to focus on everything, the entertainment 
the of the entertainment aspect of sports entertainment was way more of a focus with the WWF, and I'm more of a pure wrestling. I'm I'm right there with you. I consider myself a WCW guy. That's when because I first got into wrestling through, I think it might have even been WrestleMania too. Was was I, I was at someone's house and I saw it and. Um, they gave me a VHS copy of it, which I wore out over the years, which it's, it's hilarious. Cause that's considered one of the worst WrestleManias ever. And that's the one I know I've seen more than any other, but that's cause I was a little kid. Uh, but it, what really clicked for me, it was, it was that, that 6am Saturday morning WCW show. And then yeah. followed by the one at night uh, back when it was NWA and Crockett. And, and then when Turner took it over, you, I, I'm right there with you. It was a pure wrestling show it was it was so much fun. The characters were more dynamic, and you couldn't help but get behind uh, guys like Sting, and when he was a face, guys like Luger. In fact, the first wrestling event I ever went to, I was living in Florida at the time, and it was uh, Florida Championship Wrestling. I think it was the name of the organization, uh, not FCW that became NXT. It was a, a different organization that eventually was bought yeah. out by Turner. I was gonna say Dusty owned. Florida. Yes, yeah, yeah. and uh, Grams, and it was the their biggest title was the Southern Heavyweight Championship. It was all part of the NWA, and Luger was the champion. And on that card, there was a cage barbed wire cage match with the Bushwhackers. Um, of course, at the, they would have been known as the Sheep Herders when they were vicious heels. Yes, and. Uh, the thing I just I remember for some reason when I was a little kid I was really fascinated. I asked if I could because we had front row seats. I asked if I could go up and and touch the ring rope, and they were like, "Sure." Um, but yeah, that was that was really cool. And then a year or so later, we went to a WWE house show, and it was when uh, Hacksaw Jim Duggan was feuding with Andre the Giant, and Andre got the win because Hacksaw and Jim Duggan in no way in hell is ever going to beat up Andre the Giant. I mean, let's be real here. So, yeah, and and I was, at the time, we, we got, of course, all the stuff on TBS, which was great, uh, and then I watched World Class Championship Wrestling, which I also loved. Um, when it came on, when when UWF, when Mid-South became UWF and they had their, their weekly show, uh, I watched that religiously. That was so good. I remember... Uh, when Dr. Death, Steve Williams was a champion and he had a feud with one man gang. And then the big boss man was there before he was big boss man. Uh, that was, that was good stuff. I big Bubba Rogers. Yes. Big Bubba Rogers. And it, you know, it's a shame that when he went into the hall of fame, rest in peace, that they did not highlight and talk about that part of his career. It's, it's not like WWE doesn't own the footage for Pete's sake. I, and, and that was sad, and people don't put over the fact that he used to wrestle in a suit. Yes. Yeah, I mean, he was in a suit. I mean, it was something back then, him, Curtis Hughes, that was something they did. But he wrestled, when he was a big Bubba Rogers, he pretty much wrestled in a suit. And I just thought that was like, you know, now you have everybody in this athletic gear, Under Armour or whatever, or but now it was back then you wrestle he wrestled in a suit. I just thought that was so impressive. I was like, you know how hot it had to be at some of those <laughs> at oh some my. of those little facilities that didn't have air conditioning. Yeah. I heard about the sportatorium and how bad it was and he wrestled in a suit. That, that... And, and he could he could work. He could work. I, I, I miss those big guys like that. I miss the big guys that were just big. You know, they try to make everybody athletic now. Uh, so, you know, try to get them as ripped as possible. But I just remember the big guys, him and the Earthquake and One Man Gang that were just huge oh, guys. Gang, yes. And they could tell a story with their body, you know, and it was a very simple story. I'm bigger than the other guy. <laughs> so <laughs> that, that works out. Yeah, I, I kind of had, I liked those guys, but I was always drawn to some of the smaller guys, like I, I would say my favorite wrestler probably of all time is Arn Anderson. Uh, wow. That is crazy. You were probably the only other person I know that says that that is my favorite wrestler of all time. Excellent. And I, man, his, when he retired that, that speech he gave, I was in tears. Yeah. And then his whole giving his spot to Kurt Henning uh -huh. tears. 
I mean, that was incredible. And that uh, that was one of the first storylines that really, really upset me because I understood what they were going for, but I felt like it should have, like, they should have had him in the spot for, like, five to six months instead of only a few weeks before he turned on. Yeah, that, and that showed, I think, some of the 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 flaws in what Bischoff and company was doing at the time because they were so focused on immediate ratings that they squandered a lot of opportunities and had they focused more on some long-term storytelling and letting it build to a payoff because they were so desperately worried about beating Raw every week. Uh, and, and that just... And that led, what it ended up doing is it led to a whole bunch of shows that at first were really freaking awesome. And then after a while it was like, okay, here comes the NWO to beat everybody up. Yeah. And it was like, we're out of time, like every week. And it was like, and it was, I think, I think I was about six months in. I I mean, because they did it for two years. I was about six months in before I started, I would, uh, I would uh, record WCW. And then watch Raw because Raw was at least different. I knew how WCW was going to end. Yeah, that's and it was like, yeah, that is true. But Raw had some dark days at that time. There was that point when they put the belt on Sid, and right before you know Austin had his breakthrough, and they had Mister America, and they were going against. I mean, the Hart Foundation was doing some good stuff. But my God, some a lot of that was that was just right before they decided to go, you know, balls deep with the attitude stuff, and they were still holding on to the the cartoony things. But yeah, that was uh, those were some dark that, days. That was Vin- Vince's vision of the WWF. You know, that horrible time. That was Vince's vision because it was kitty. It was very much played, and there was a lot of America versus Canada. He's big on that type of. The patriotism type of uh, storylines. I mean, the Attitude Era was for him was horrible. He hates the Attitude Era, but it was something he had to do to survive. That is why, as now as USA and all those are pushing to get closer to the Attitude Era, because of course they want those five and six ratings that WWE were pull- pulling back then. The WWE is refusing because, in Vince's mind, it's a children's product. You know, it's Vince on the one hand has been this brilliant businessman and what he has done with this company, and on the other hand, he's a blithering idiot. Yeah. And he, and, just, I, I just don't get it. I mean, you build a billion dollar company, you know, and you you do that, and everybody's like, "You're a genius! You're a genius! You're a genius!" And of course, you can't help but believe it. I love Vince McMahon. I, I mean, seriously, it is probably in my lifetime is going to be Jesus like and then Vince McMahon you know that's kind of that's how it works for me it's like that's the hierarchy I mean he I've even said he has pretty much you know shaped the way I think about a lot of things so I get it I mean I get why Vince McMahon is that way but at some point in time just like every old coach on any sports team you're your people know what you're gonna write. People know what you're gonna do, and it just becomes very predictable. I think the product right now is fairly predictable, <laughs> and so it's just like as you get Triple H taking more control. And I don't, you know, he says it's not him. He does a very good job of deflecting and taking the political role, but you can see it's getting edgier. But you can see there's always that cap on how edgy he'll let it get. Yeah, I think it's. I think once once Vince relinquishes control, and once Kevin Dunn is fired, I think things. I think they have to get better. Now that having been said, and this is a great way to segue into into the current product, but um, I think it has overall gotten better because it used to be, you know, just a few months ago, prior to the brand split, with the exception of building up to a couple of pay per views here and there, it was. Oh my God, there's five minutes of worthwhile television in this three hour show. Why am I doing this to myself? And I'm not even going to bother with SmackDown because they're just going to redo the same crap again anyway. And then it's like, thank God for NXT because this is fantastic. And now it's at least you have two shows 
that are are overall very enjoyable doing different things with completely different feels. That's, I think, the biggest success so far of the brand split is they feel like two totally different shows. Yes, I'm very much more a SmackDown fan than I am a Raw fan. And, I mean, and there's it's not even close, really, because SmackDown's more of a wrestling show. Exactly, it is. What's funny is... I find myself enjoying SmackDown more, but I think Raw has a better roster. Definitely, definitely. If if you could get all the people I really like on Raw, move them over to SmackDown, and leave the creative team in SmackDown in charge, that would be fantastic. I would love to see what you know that team would do with a guy like Cesaro or Sami Zayn or. Um, or Kevin Owens, even though Raw is doing Kevin Owens a pretty good solid at the moment, um, so it would be it would be nice to see that. But it's it's also really nice with the split, seeing people like you know Dolph Ziggler getting serious pushes, even though so many of the fans out there have a hard time taking it seriously because it's Dolph Ziggler, and as much as we love watching him you know wrestle, we know in the end the poor guy's eating a pin. He's a high level jobber. He really is. I mean, he. I mean, he doesn't. He doesn't lose to the lower roster. But I mean, when's the last time he won a feud? He lost the feud to Baron Corbin. Uh, gets drafted to SmackDown. Somehow fails up, and is in the world title. Is in the main event. <laughs> then yep. he loses in the main event. This critical match that's supposed to be the most important match of his life, and he's immediately given an Intercontinental title shot. Like, yeah. Well, yeah, that's, I, mean, I mean, it's and he's only given it to make the champion look good, right? And that's the the that's one of the problems when you have a roster that is so small as the SmackDown roster is, and you've got a guy as talented as Dolph is who can make anyone look good in the ring. You have to give him high profile matches. Uh, in a way, he's almost like a modern day Brad Armstrong. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Though I, I th- can see that. Yeah. Though I think he's better than Brad was, uh, and he does not job as much as Brad does because Brad was just a full blown jobber. Uh, but he always I, looked good in his matches. I give him. I always say he is our new Billy Gunn. That is. That's what I was like. Yeah. He'll, he'll be. If you want to throw him in a tag team, he'll look good. Intercontinental title. He has. You look at him. You hear him talk. He has everything you think a world champion should have. But then he loses every time. Yeah. And it's if they would, I mean, I think it would take a good probably year to rehab the guy. I think it's still possible. What would probably rehab him more than anything else is for his contract to end. He leave WWE, go to Ring of Honor and New Japan and just tear it up there and win titles, win a lot of, you know, have big lots of lots of big wins and come back in a couple of years and go I told you I was good yeah the Cody Rhodes thing right but the the thing about Dolph Ziggler if you ask Triple H you ask anyone they'll say he's one of the best wrestlers on the roster they'll tell you that and then they'll make him lose it's just it's the, the, the knowledge that he is a great wrestler no one will argue against the knowledge that he's probably one of the best wrestlers on the roster. No one to argue against. He's Kevin. He's Kevin Nash's favorite wrestler because he says he's the most like Sean. He does everything Sean does. He's still gonna lose though. Yeah, exactly. And that and the few times they've given him the mic, I feel like he's falling flat. He tries to do the whole passionate thing. And I've seen him more in his personal life with his comedy and that kind of stuff. I would like to see that character, the smart ass character, come off more than this. I, I work really hard. I'm one of the best in the business of what I do because it comes off as very, very like a poor man's John Cena ish because he's kind of saying the same thing. Right. Yeah. Oh, you're right. You're right. And if, we'll talk about SmackDown first since we're we're talking about Ziggler. Let's. Okay. Um. But uh, oh, did you see Talking Smack? This last week, I miss Talking Smack. I watch SmackDown, so I would be ready for the show. But uh, Talking, uh, I was actually traveling from Orlando at the time, so I missed Talking Smack. Uh, Should have watched it, but I forgot. Ziggler was on there, and he was actually really good. Very he, but he was doing the whole passionate thing. Um, 
So I'm kind of hoping that at some point they've got to do a change with him. I mean, he he's great as a baby face, but maybe he just needs to snap and become a real sarcastic smart ass and just tear people up. Uh, but let, let's kind of go through go through SmackDown. Um, so it was from Lincoln, Nebraska this last week, and the show opened up with Daniel Bryan in the ring uh, talking about the women's championship. Uh, speaking of, what do you think of the SmackDown women's title belt? I, I think uh, when I saw it, I was like, oh, okay, it's the blue version of the other belt. I'm good with that. Yeah, that was, that was. It doesn't. It didn't. I. I mean, honestly, that color blue really pops to me. So I. I really do like the belt, but it's just they just they went with the simpler. This is a blue version of the red belt, you know, that kind of thing. So I was yeah. okay with it. I think something that I think some people have have kind of argued against is I've heard arguments that they have basically been very lazy and that they just made the same belts for the world titles, the women's title and the tag titles. And to me, I think that's actually a good thing Mm -hmm. because if the belts are basically the same, just slightly different in color, it keeps them at the same level because it would would be really, really easy to make that universal title mean more than the world title. But when they're literally the same strap with the exception of color, it's harder to do that. Um, and back when they had the the world title and then the WWE title, which that spinner belt and the belt that CM Punk held, ugliest title I have ever seen. That thing was awful. But it, it was, you could definitely see the writing on the wall. It's like, okay, this is our championship. Oh, yeah, here's WCW's. We'll just, we'll still keep it around for a while. Uh, which I always, I thought was irritating. because I, he, I have a bigger problem with the whole idea that they both of the companies have belts because it just feels like everything that was built up in the draft that this is going to be the exclusive title of SmackDown, this is going to be exclusive title of Raw, they pretty much just made an extra belt for both the uh, both divisions, so neither one has an exclusive property, so it kind of that's annoying to me. I can see that it's I, when I in that that's very valid. I I just I'm glad that I'm glad that the them keeping them similar from the fact that you when you compare them side by side they, they it gives them basically it keeps them on a level playing field. Yeah. Uh, definitely, definitely. So, um yeah, it, I mean it makes the Raw and SmackDown uh very even two different sides of the same coin and I yeah, I definitely agree. It's like Charlotte doesn't have the big belt, you know, whoever wins the SmackDown belt is not the secondary champion. She's also the other women's champion. So I right. get that. Yeah. And so the Daniel Bryan brought out Becky Lynch first, and she was she's just super over. Um, and I just I have a fear that she is going to become the women's Cesaro slash Dolph Ziggler. Yes, uh, but it's every time I watch her in this division, and they've got this division. It's the poor. I mean, there are like six people in it, uh, which mm-hmm. is just kind of sad. But you've got. Alexa Bliss, who I think is fantastic on the mic. Uh, yes. And yeah. she has gotten so much better just in the last year. Uh, that pairing with Blake and Murphy, I think, did her wonders. Um, and so that that's, I think she's got a lot of potential. Uh, you've got Carmella, who now as a heel has some fire under her. Because her doing the Cass and Enzo stick without Cass and Enzo was cringeworthy. And it was... They got no reaction, yes. and then people didn't hate her. They didn't love her. I mean, she was in Brooklyn. She is a New Jersey, New York girl, and she was in Brooklyn, and she came out and got absolutely no reaction. Yeah, no one gave a crap, and that that's a bad, bad sign. But her, but she does. It, I remember back her original vignettes as the in the hair salon. She was a bitch. Mm-hmm. And they bring that back and have her just taking people out. I think that will help make up for the fact that she is very limited in the ring. Uh, she's gotten better. Don't get me wrong. She has her little stick. She has her moves that she does. Right. But she doesn't get outside of that at all. Correct. I do like her finisher. Yeah. Uh, uh, but that was, I mean, and like uh, she's, I've met her a few times. She's a really cool person. It's just. I mean, something about her just, it, if she's not with Enzo and Cass, I don't care about her. 
Yeah, I, I'm. Don't. I'm. I'm hoping this heel character makes me hate her a little because I think that would make me feel something towards her. I'm right there with you. I'm right. She from especially after watching uh, Breaking Ground, which I really hope they do a season two of because that show was fantastic. Uh, she seems like a great person. Uh, oh, yeah. So yeah, and and you want to see her do well. And so that's what makes it even, I think that's what makes it even harder is when you watch her out there and the poor girl's just falling flat on her face and it's not working. So hopefully, yeah, this heel run, um, eventually, by the time it was all said and done, had all six of them out there. Natty was out there, um, and Natalia came, or Naomi was out there, Nikki Bella came out. So what are your, okay, of all of these, what are your just thoughts in general on this division? Okay, uh... Becky, of course, I think she's one of the best women, if not the best women's wrestler in the world. Um, Nikki Bella, I've never been big on, but her in-ring work is solid. And since she's really, she's fairly good on the mic, that actually helps out. I don't like her as a face, but I get why they did it. Um, Alexa Bliss, I, I, I don't like her really as a wrestler. I think she's better as the heel manager. Uh, but you know, in this division, I could see her. She's she's a solid in ring worker, so she'll be a person that loses a lot. Uh, <laughs> Naomi Naomi has been one of my favorites for a long time because she actually brings something di- uh, different to the division. If you notice with the women's division, they all have solid in ring in ring work, and then they do a submission move. I mean, that's all of them. They all have the same cookie cutter type of type and she's different she's the high flyer she's she's the athletic style she does moves in and sometimes it's even you can tell where it's hard for the other people to keep up with her because she moves so fast yeah so I, I really uh definitely appreciate her and i think they could do more with her if they build up if they focus on how much of an athlete she is they could do more with her um natalia classic wrestler she's the cesaro of the women's division I mean, she's always going to be just solid. She's going to put on a solid match with whoever you put her in there with. I mean, the women's division, as far as the different personalities, I think is is perfect. Um, I I I really 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 don't know where they're going to go with the champion. I'm afraid it's going to go on Nikki, but we'll see. Yeah, yeah we'll get to predictions here in a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm with you there. I think personality wise, they have six fantastic people on this division they personality wise and they're all actually pretty good on the mic uh most of them are really good and naomi is is warming up i'm warming up to naomi uh, i like this new her day glow dancing thing is good because that girl can move uh-huh. um and and she is good in the ring she's fast too and the thing i always notice when watching them wrestle is you just, I just kind of shake my head. As solid as a lot of them are, it's just like, wow, Becky Lynch is in such a different league than all of you combined. It's and even even including Natalia, as good as Natalia is, Becky Lynch is on a completely different level, uh, just a different playing field. And I think part of it is because Natalia was for so many years wrestling really shitty girls, mm-hmm. and that it dumbed down her ability. Same thing happened to Paige. You look at Paige's early stuff in WWE and how good she was, and you saw her more recent stuff, and you're like, oh, damn, what happened to her? Um, I mean, there might be other things going on there, but still. Also, I have to say, Natty has the absolute worst-looking sharpshooter in history. Yes. She puts it on backwards for Pete's sake. Yes. Drives me crazy. uh, Yeah, uh, with... I thought she would put it on more like Brett's, but... uh, it, it's 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 very weird how she does it, but the way she does it, and I can see as far as a storytelling part in the ring, it's more reversible. So I think that's why she does it that way. Yeah, you're probably uh, right. It's, it's it's a very loose sharpshooter, and you're dealing with, I mean, her and Becky, they probably could you know work with men. They wouldn't care about uh, they wouldn't care about it being pretty stiff. Right. The girls are still kind of dainty. You know what I'm saying? And True. If you get too stiff. <laughs> they're probably going to be like running to the back because yeah. I, you can see it with Becky and Natalia. They they work a lot harder with each other than they do with anyone else. Yes, that is true. And, and, and Natalia, whenever she's in the ring with someone like Becky or when she was in the ring with Charlotte and, and Sasha, 
you could see she was fine. You could almost see it in her face. Like finally I'm wrestling someone that I can really, you know, sink my teeth into. I can yeah. do something with this. You can lay that forearm in and it's yeah. not that big a deal. Cause and that's my biggest complaint with like, uh, honestly, the newer people that aren't Charlotte and Sasha, their strikes look horrible, and I just wish they wouldn't do them. Yeah, I'm I'm right there with you. One and one last thing on on this segment, I, I I'm kind of with you on Nikki Bella. I think she is, I think she does not get as much credit for how good she's gotten in the ring. Not that she is a great wrestler by any means, but she is very solid, and she has obviously improved a lot over the years. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it, you could even just see her improvement in that 300-day Divas run, which they did just to screw over AJ Lee. Uh, but you could see her improving in that. And it was like as she got better opponents, she got better. Um, I think she kind of saw the writing on the wall with, with like, okay, if I'm going to still be relevant, I'm going to have to be able to, to you know, hang with Becky Lynch, Sasha Banks, and Charlotte. Because right now I can't. Um my thing, my biggest complaint with her, and it's probably a personality thing. And obviously, I've never met the woman. I don't know her from Adam. She's probably very nice, but she comes off as one of the most vapid, plastic people on the face of the earth. And when she, yeah, when and that's she, why she doesn't work as a face for me. I'm right there with you. When she was on commentary at some point during this show, I just was listening to her. I'm like, oh my god, shut up, you plastic bitch. Yeah, please. I'm so pretty. Just yeah. Know that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's move on. See what else happened. There was a backstage uh, scene with Dean Ambrose at a food table. This does Dean no no great shakes. Prop comic Dean, as some people like to call him. Um, yeah, just probably less said about that the better. What I would like him to lean more towards the Brian Pillman Roddy Piper character that we were all kind of promised. The crazy type, and I just don't think he it comes off. He comes off as a very tame version of them right now. Right, yeah, I'm I'm right there with you. So, what did you think about his appearance on the Stone Cold podcast? Oh, he gave him nothing. <laughs> he, I mean, I mean seriously. I mean, it was Stone Cold was trying to pull something out of him. He came at him with every different angle. I'm not a big Stone Cold podcast person, but he came at him from every angle to try to get him to say something. The only thing he got him to say is to pretty much put down Brock Lesnar. Yeah. Yeah, he actually, he got more out of Brock Lesnar than he got out of of Dean Ambrose, and that's saying a lot, because Brock Lesnar does not like people. Uh, And and Now, I kind of attribute this to, I think Dean Ambrose, the, the guy, I think he's just a very private person Uh uh-huh he is and i don't think he's being out of character sometimes on things like this i don't think he's super comfortable with now you give him a mic in character and he's fantastic um but if he's actually supposed to sit there and be him you know quote unquote himself he's just not going to open up a whole lot um and I don't think that did him any... He, he actually does not even admit that he's with Ray Young, Renee Young. She had, she talks about it more than he does, because he uh, does not want anyone to know. And that was I mean, fun. Just, there was a really funny moment on Talking Smack about that. Um, Renee Young was asked who she thought was going to win the uh, the title match, and she said Dean Ambrose. And Daniel Bryan just looks at her and goes, really? And and Dolph Ziggler was giving her shit about it too. It was so funny. Oh, yeah, because uh, it's like they're so obviously together. <laughs> yes, lucky, lucky man. And I like Renee Young. I tell you what, that was a hell of a find for WWE. She is fantastic. Um, aside the fact that she's a beautiful young lady, she is passionate about wrestling. She sounds competent and intelligent, and um, everyone that you can you can tell the people there respect her. Um, yeah, she was just. She's fantastic, and if if her contract ever ends, they need to just just offer her money, 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 because you know ESPN will be offering her lots of money. Um, yeah, definitely. I yeah. believe I'm like she is a legit reporter that happens to work in the WWE, and she, I mean, she's, I mean, the first time I saw her on screen, she just had an energy and a, a look at me type face and everything about her, and she's not too pretty to where she's intimidating (laughs) that which is she's a very attractive woman 
but she's not like super hot where you're not paying attention to what she's saying. Right, she's that girl next door beautiful. Very much so. Very yeah. much the Jennifer Aniston of the WWE. Exactly. I, I'd, I'd say she's prettier than Jennifer Aniston, though, in I, my I, humble opinion. I mean, maybe now, but in the Friends days, Jennifer Aniston <laughs> is pretty, pretty. I never liked that show, Friends. I, I, I can watch that show anytime, any day. It's actually one of my favorite shows. Oh, well, there you go. There you go. So we next had Daniel Bryan and Shane McMahon backstage. Shane was basically telling Daniel, stop uh, antagonizing people on Talking Smack, which is, but that's what he does. That's like his, his shtick. Um, I mean, that's the only reason to watch Talking Smack. <laughs> it really is, because Daniel Bryan, yeah. you can tell he gives no shits, man. He just does not care. He's going to say what he wants to say. And even in that, even in the, 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 when he was plugging, um, the total Bella's thing, you could almost see it in his face. Like guys, they're telling me I have to say this. Yeah. This is the dumbest thing ever. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, they were joined by Ms. and Maurice, which then, uh, segued into a, uh, Ms. in-ring angry promo, which eventually turned into a match with Apollo, uh, Cruz, uh, with Ziggler on commentary. Um, now I've seen you've posted some stuff on the Facebook very uh, as a Miz fan. Are you is that, I, is that pretty accurate? I I love the Miz. I just think he is very much eighties nineties heel. He plays the character no matter how good he is. He can you know, fans are cheering for him. He can flip it like unlike anyone else, and he can make you hate him again. And he is very, very good at that. And he's like, he plays the heel character. It's like he watched, he, it's like he watched Jerry the King Lawler and uh, he watched Ric Flair or something because he can always flip it back to make you hate him. He can make you boo him. After that impassioned promo that he gave on Daniel Bryan, everybody was like pipe bomb, CM Punk. He came out, everybody was cheering for him. He flipped it within a minute. So impressive. Yeah, he made them start booing him because that is his job. Yeah, I think I think he doesn't get enough credit for as great as he is on the mic, and and that that promo he did where he ripped into Daniel Bryan was was fantastic. I still don't think he's the best in ring worker in the world. There's and the, just there's some moves that he does that I you like the one where he he drops the back of their neck onto his knee and turns it into basically a version of the Rude Awakening neck breaker. Yeah. That looks pathetic. I'm like, what is that even supposed to do? Does that, is that, does that hurt? Can someone do that to me so I can see if that hurts? I'm sure the neck breaker part of it doesn't feel good, but the part where he like gingerly puts their head on his knee, I'm like, dude, what are you doing? But it goes to what Daniel Bryan says, and then it actually makes him more feel. His soft in-ring work, the kind of style, actually makes him more of a heel. So the pure wrestling fans are still going to hate him. Because if he was really good in the ring, when you're really good, Kevin Owens, Cesaro, people like that, it's very hard for you to be a heel because people still want to cheer you. His in-ring work and how he wins and not necessarily being the most crisp person actually adds to his personality. Yeah, you're you're right there. That is that is true. That is true. Uh, we then had AJ Styles doing a backstage interview with Renee Young on the Talking Smack set. He got all pissy. Um, AJ Styles has been just pun intended phenomenal since he's been in WWE. I think the MVP of the WWE. Yeah, he he made Reigns look amazing. He made. Uh, he, he's uh, he made John Cena step up his game, which you know the great wrestlers do with Cena. Um, he he worked as a face. He's working as a heel. I I, I mean I I'm really I he's actually I used to have a huge man crush on him. Like first like first two three years of TNA. I mean I was really really into AJ Styles, and it has brought that emotion back. Or now, and it's just like I just can't wait to see him work. It, it, he has a great match with whoever he's in the ring with. Yeah. He actually made me care about Apollo Cruz. He made Apollo Cruz look amazing in the ring. Yeah, and, and poor Apollo. Yeah. Speaking, I mean, when we didn't actually even talk about the the match with Apollo Cruz, I don't think they know what to do with this guy. He has no character. I mean, he literally has no character. 
But I've heard when on mm. the indies as Uha Nation, he had some really good heel runs, and he has yeah. character. They're just... I, I don't know. I feel like, and I think SmackDown, unfortunately, is a little heel-heavy right now. So that is the problem you're going to run into. But I felt like when they were doing The Miz and Apollo Crews, The Miz should have flipped Apollo Crews. Because I think The Miz could get Apollo Crews over way better than Apollo Crews is ever going to be able to get himself over. And then he could kind of go along with the arrogant elite athlete, how he's better than everyone else type of role, almost like a Rob Van Dam type of role. Yeah, I could, I could see that. I'm I'm just literally better than you. At my athletic ability is on another level, and I just thought that should be his character. But right now, he's just really I, I, he's the most boring wrestler on the roster, and that is hard for me to say. <laughs> yeah, it's it's he is. Uh, I mean, you you almost you look up white meat baby face in the dictionary, and it's going to have a picture of Apollo Crews smiling at you. But it is going to make his heel turn, and if, they're, if that's what they're setting up, it's going to make it so much more significant But True. when he actually does it because he's smiling, smiling, smiling. All he does is smile, and then he loses. So when that happens, it'll be great. But it's like the the, Us- the Usos just did it, so, yeah. Yeah. And we'll, we'll, yeah, get, we'll to, get to that. Yeah. yeah. So there was an American Alpha vignette. Uh, the Usos had a backstage interview where you could see them you could you, for the last few weeks you could see the seeds of the heel turn coming yes. uh bray wyatt did his bray wyatt isms on during a backstage promo and i love bray wyatt it's just sometimes i tune out I'm like yeah he's bray Wyatting again yay i, I don't know what you know, I, once i found out he really does write his own stuff I mean, he has more of the freedom than anyone. I do listen to the words of what he says, and some of his, some of, uh, some of how he illustrates things and tells it in a different way. I, I, I am amazed by his promo skills, and I'm like, I know how you could get because he stays in that same type of tone, and he even escalates his voice at the same time and lowers it at the same time, so it can get very monotone and boring. But if you listen to what he says, he really does a great job as a promo person. But, yeah, it's uh, it's kind of it's kind of getting Bray Wyatt does his Bray Wyatt thing. Yeah, and I think my problem is almost to the same, same extent with Z- Ziggler in that Bray gets in these high profile matches and he loses. Mm-hmm. He it's he's guaranteed to make a, to get a good match out of whoever he's working with. And I don't know how much I don't he didn't do much time in the indies, did he? Was he pretty much an FCW NXT? No, yeah, he was uh, signed immediately when okay. we, when Which, your dad works for the WWE, it doesn't Yeah. So you if you think about uh, of the last say since 16 years you think about the people that have been just produced solely by WWE mm-hmm. that are, I mean, you've got your, your big stars like your John Cena is. Yeah, I know he did like five minutes in some Indies in California, but does that really count? It doesn't. Uh, exactly. Um, you, you've got your Randy Orton's and all that, but as far as people that really the WWE system created, I think your overall two biggest successes are, especially as far as just the whole package, especially in ring work, you've got to say Dolph Ziggler and Bray Wyatt are Definitely. are the two their two biggest successes. Because everyone else that's come in that has been phenomenal in the ring, for the most part, has come from somewhere else. They cut their teeth somewhere else, except Randy Orton. And if Randy Orton wasn't amazing in the ring, then something's wrong. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, I, I, n- now knowing that Bray's writing his own stuff, which actually doesn't surprise me considering how good he is, I will, I will listen a little bit more, but it's just the whole, it's like you get this great production and I, I miss the Wyatt family. I miss Luke Harper. Mm-hmm. He, he needs Luke Harper next to him, uh, because Luke Harper's just one fantastic, uh, in it's very wrestler. Oh my God. Very old school. Uh, very Bruiser Brody ish. Yeah, uh, he he can work, and I mean what he does, it looks really good, but it's fairly safe, and that's uh, a big thing I look for, especially in big guys who can really do some damage if they want to. Oh yeah, that, 
that what they do, you know, is pretty safe. And he's he's very good wrestler, uh, uh, very underrated for how big of a guy he is. But his character, because of his look, that's pretty much the character he's going to have to play. And that's fine. That yeah. is, and I think I I mean, especially in a brand split era, give it a couple of years, I could see them eventually putting the world title on him. Yeah. I mean, he yeah. could even have a feud with Bray Wyatt at some point. Which could be fantastic, but that, I that yeah, I can't put anything past them because I never saw JBL being world champion, and he's been one of my favorite heel world champions ever. So I, I they kind of remind me of each other. I can see just that. the big dudes that can work. Yeah, that match he had um, was that in 2014 or with Ziggler that was a ladder match for the Intercontinental Title. Yeah, was fantastic. I mean, that was you know one of my favorite matches of the year. That thing was just ridiculous so luke harper hopefully he gets well soon and gets back and you know as mediocre as eric rowan is when he's with luke harper they gel really well together it's like yeah those three braun Strowman, whatever uh we'll talk about him later but those three bray luke and eric rowan together i think make a really really good unit and i'm hoping that when luke harper gets better they bring them all back together um, yeah, because te- technically Luke Harper is a free agent, right? Yes. Oh, okay. Even though he wasn't listed on that list on WWE.com, which pissed him off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we then had Nikki Bella, Becky Lynch, and Naomi against Natalia, Alexa Bliss, and Carmella. Uh, Carmella actually made Nikki tap out, which means Nikki's probably winning on Sunday. And I really hate six man matches, six women matches, six person matches, unless it generally makes sense in storylines i hate them and this was just a way for all six women to get on the get on the show and our you know i guess it did i mean if nikki puts over then i guess it did set up the storyline for this weekend but i I really hate six man matches i think they get overused in wwe in a bad way where definitely (laughs) whereas you get a six-man match say in ring of honor like recently on tv they had the briscoes teamed with Jay Lethal against the Young Bucks and Adam Cole, which yeah. completely made sense and was a fantastic match. And, of course, if you ha- if that wasn't a fantastic match, somebody was sick or something yeah. was wrong. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you've got six of the best wrestlers in the world in the ring, and it's it's got to be good. Uh, yeah. yeah, like I said, as long as it makes storyline sense, but a lot of times they take well, this tag team's in a feud with this tag team, and this single star's in this uh, feud with this single star. Let's make a six-man match. Yeah, and, and the, just... the, those suck. That's that's those. and that's bad WWE booking. I think more <laughs> yeah. than anything else. Um, we had the Usos against American Alpha in the tag team semifinals. Um, Usos attacked just right out of the gate. The match was over in like thirty seconds. And then the Usos turned heel, did the beatdown, finally turning heel. If only we could get them to turn Roman Reigns heel. Uh, but I like the Usos' attitude of, of them just being pissed. Like, you you people are seriously booing us? We've been out here making this tag team division look good for six years, yeah. and you're going to boo us? They and were we... the only thing in the division for a while. Yeah, they were. Yeah, they carried the division. Uh, I give this whole segment an A+. Plus. I mean as a perfectly done segment, how they had to lose, uh, the injury, the whole going after the leg. Uh, I just think they, I think it was just perfectly done. I mean, we saw it coming, but they did it in a way. I mean, they lost in 30 seconds, so it was like, wow. And, yeah, I, I thought the, how they went after the leg, very old school, uh, very old school, the splash. He put them in the... Uh, the half crab, and then he just splashes on his leg. I was like, "This is impressive." The, the way they did it was perfectly written. It was, and it was perfectly executed by both the groups. Agreed. Uh, I talk, I think the Usos in their personality. Uh, I when I, I watched them on Up Up Down Down or other ways, they come off as cocky bastards, and I never bought them as faces. I can and, see that. And so they very much, I never bought, they, being a heel is their perfect personality, and I just think it's going to, being heels is just going to make them more interesting, because of course when you're a heel, you can say whatever. 
Yeah. <laughs> you don't have it. So they can start going into you only hate us because we tagged with Roman Reigns. So. Yeah. Yeah, that you're right. You're right. They are, and they are really good. Now, did they? Do you know? Did they have any experience on the indies before coming, or are they also Booker T trained them. Booker T trained them. Okay. Booker T trained them at his school in Houston, and they pretty much immediately got signed after their training. Okay, so so in a way, you could say they're somewhat. They're basically products of WWE. Yeah, oh, yeah, they're definitely products of them. So then, then you would have to put them probably in that list with. The Ziggler and Bray Wyatt, and because yeah, because yeah, they really are good. I yeah. mean, you could it, the sign to me of of someone being a really good wrestler is you could see them pluck them out of the WWE, put them in New Japan, put them in Ring of Honor, uh, put them anywhere. Will they have a good match? And yes. if the answer is yes, and I think the Usos would, I think you get the Usos against the Young Bucks. I was just gonna say that team. Uh, yeah, that would just be fantastic. <laughs> That would be so much fun to watch. Um, whereas, as good as Randy Orton is, you wonder, would he survive in New Japan? I don't know if he would. Because he, he's so he, pretty and he's so... He's very particular. Yes. Uh, and, like, if you're not where you're supposed to be, when you're supposed to be, and he does not adjust well, and sometimes he'll flat out just yell at you in the middle of the rain. Poor Kofi. I, I, I am very upset that uh, we never got really a good program with Randy Orton and Drew Galloway, I just think that would have been a great program. I just It just popped in my head that I was like, I, I, I love Drew Galloway. He's probably my favorite indie guy right now because TNA is pretty much the indies now. But uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, TNA really is. Poor but yeah, Randy, Randy Orton, I think he would work with some people, but... Yeah, I think his personality, how he's been in the WWE, he's been a top guy for so long. I don't think he would I don't think he could do the grind that it would take to be the indie guy that he needs to be. Agreed. I don't think he could he's too for lack of a better word, soft. Yeah. Uh he is he's had that very comfortable life in WWE. Uh being the cuz even if you are even the lowest paid you know, low card dude in the WWE, you're making good money. Yeah. Um, so he, you've got to, I mean, he's got to be loaded. So he would show up in, in Japan and most of those guys can really go. Yeah. And, and they, they would give no fucks. They would just look at him like, uh, and you're special because, and then kick him in the face. Yeah. So, uh, but I don't think Bob Orton's that big a name in Japan. No, no, but man, if someday, if we could get a Shinsuke Nakamura Randy Orton match, oh yes, that yes. could be really good. Oh yeah, but if he dislocates Randy Orton jaw, he will probably be released the next day. <laughs> yeah, there are just a few people that you just do not f with in yeah, WWE. So. Yeah. Um, so uh, speak, Randy had a backstage interview that I really don't remember anything about. I mean, he's oh, been he he's actually been great. did a pretty good job. Of, uh, of the promo because I really generally hate Randy Orton on the promo. But, <coughs> excuse me, because he does this monotone thing. But um, he told the story about the serpent and how he wanted to. He he wanted the man and the rabbit, and I just thought that was that was perfectly done. But the problem was, it's like who would tell someone their strategy like that? True. I'm waiting on you to mess up. Uh. Yeah, that's not really wise, but I just thought the I thought he did well on the promo. You can tell he's been working on it. Yeah, I think he has been since he's come back from injury. He has been really good. Mm. Um, I think he got really bored for a while there, uh, and because it was the wrestling soup guys always make jokes about how you know once a year he gives a crap, and when he for that month when he cares, he's awesome, and the mm-hmm. rest of the year he phones it in. And maybe it's just to the point now where there are enough folks on the roster that he feels like maybe he's in that same position Natalia was in, that he feels like, okay, finally here are some people that I could really work with and and have some really good matches with, maybe. Maybe I'm reading too much into it. But he has been, even before he got injured and since he's been back, he actually comes off like he cares and he's yeah, having no fun. The pressure's off of him. He does have a light and work schedule, and you know, and he's happy at home. You know, that's a big thing. Is like, 
Uh, he's happy with his uh, wife and his kids, so that's going to always add to how you perform at work. So that's that is thing that is very true. Saying. And as you get older, you get softer. So he's probably not as into himself as he used to be. That is true. Cause, oh, you know he was an arrogant, arrogant guy. No, in yeah, his 20s. no, he thought he was the best thing that, that ever happened to the wrestling business. <laughs> um. So what did we have from here? From here, we had uh, Fandango. It's just playing the role of a jobber to be punked out by Kane. This was awful. Yeah. Um, the tattoo lady did make me laugh, though. Yeah, I mean, she she was kind of she was funny. I, yeah, I so was like, she was very energetic, and I like I don't know like I'm guessing she was an actress, but yeah, she uh she made me laugh. Yeah. So my thing with I think Fandango and Tyler Breeze are a good pair together. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Tyler Breeze is fantastic. His, his run in NXT, he he always delivered. He is so good. They have had no idea, I think, what to do with him in WWE, mostly because I think Vince looks at him and goes, I don't get it, Yeah, which, which is a sign of death. Fandango, I think, other than being a buff, good-looking dude, sucks. Uh, he's not a good talker. His ring work is meh. But they mesh well as a team. And uh, for now, at least, it, I think it'll be good. Eventually, I'm sure they'll turn on each other, and hopefully the match won't suck. I feel super bad for Fandango because he got stuck with the Fandango character. I just think it's so not him that you can see it. I just think, I mean, it's a force. It's definitely a character that's nothing like his personality. And I think he, I think he would work a stronger style. I think, I think he would be completely different. Because you can't wrestle, your name can't be Fandango, and you'd be a ballroom dancer and be a super aggressive wrestler. It doesn't work with the character. So I, I think, I don't think we've ever seen him as him as Johnny Curtis. So it, it just kind of sucks for him. Yeah, I, that you know, you're you're absolutely right. Now, did he do much on the Indies before coming in? I don't know, and and that's something you won't hear a lot from me. But I don't know. I think he was in. I think he. I definitely was in FCW as Johnny Curtis, and they liked him. Vince thought he had a good look, and Vince came up with this. Vince saw an episode of Dancing with the Stars and oh, Jesus decided Christ. he was going to really? be the ballroom dancing character. And oh. unfortunately, he got stuck with a very '90s gimmick, you know, and. Oh, it's such a bad gimmick, too. Oh, and he, and he's guy. done everything he can to make it work, and you know, and he stayed employed. So I give him credit on that. But yeah, that, that, yeah, that is true. Got <laughs> to give the man credit for that. Um, what happened after this? We had AJ Styles walking around backstage screaming at people. Yeah, I thought uh, that was pretty funny. Yeah, him throwing that dude's phone was was pretty awesome. Yeah, uh, there <laughs> was pick up your phone. <laughs> yeah. There was another Kurt Hawkins vignette. And admittedly, for me, there was a number of years where I didn't watch wrestling, and Kurt Hawkins was a guy who was in WWE during that time. So uh, I, I don't know anything about this guy. Yeah, uh, a big thing I hope they build up on, him and Kurt, him and Zack Ryder were tag team champions. They were called the Major Brothers, and then they were Zack Ryder and Curtis Hawkins. They were, they were edgeheads. And he's a very good worker. And and him and like I said, him and Zack Ryder had pretty good chemistry. So I'm hoping with the whole hype bros thing, they, you know, kind of like hey, even even if it's just a hey, I know you kind of thing or welcome back type of thing, that would be cool. The whole Chuck Norris gimmick that they're doing, yeah. I actually dig on that. The reason I dig it is because other than that. People can people are saying Kurt Hawkins' name, and most people probably don't remember his first run. So, all right, well, good. I will. Uh, <laughs> uh, it gives me a little more to anticipate, so that's good. Speaking yeah. of Zack Ryder, next was the Hype Bros against Rhino and Heath Slater in the next semifinal tag uh, tournament match. So, the Hype Bros, Mojo Rawley, bless his heart, he seems like a nice dude. He really does, and that he is energetic as all get out. But he he was one of the few cases where you would watch him on NXT and it just didn't work. And you get him to the bigger stage, to the, no offense to the mainstream audience, but a dumbed down wrestling audience, uh-huh. and he gets over. I I think he is going to be far more successful in the main roster on SmackDown and on Raw if he ever goes over there than he was ever going to be in NXT. Because a guy like that, in front of a smarky crowd, 
not going to go well. He he was straight WWE signed, uh, like had never trained or even taken a bump until he got with the WWE. So because you know he was a football player, they liked right. the football player guys, and he had a lot of en- energy. So he kind of went along, and they're trying to make him work. Um, yeah, he does nothing for me. <laughs> I, yeah. I, mean, I, I I really he's one of those guys. I could I could I feel like I could cast him in a different character. Uh, we were talking about earlier Big Bubba Rogers, right? I would because he's a big dude. He's a huge dude. Um, you know, Mojo Rawley is a big guy. You throw him in a suit, and you kind of have him as a bodyguard type person, and he just beats up people. I could buy that. Yeah, but this whole that. the hype guy, dude, it's just, it's so cheesy. It's so, it's so like coming off as you're going to be the comedy part of WWE forever. I can never take you seriously right now. Yeah. I think a lot of that is th- this is a case where that's actually his personality based on everything I saw on Breaking oh, Ground. Yeah. Um and and he is very charismatic and the fact that he is a complete WWE product, he's I mean, that's they've done well with him. They have trained mm-hmm. him well. He is he's competent in the ring. Um and I think the pairing with Zack Ryder it works okay. Uh, it was again talking about breaking ground. Um, watching how they became friends because at first Zack Ryder, you could tell, was like, "Why the hell am I doing this?" Um, but the fact that they kind of became friends, even though their personalities obviously do not mesh, um, I think it was kind of a cool story. And again, he seems like a nice dude. He does nothing for me. I don't take them seriously as champions at all. But yeah, I could see at some point down the line uh, once the hype bros thing finally it finally you know loses its steam you could have uh someone basically hire him he turns on Zack Ryder beats the tar out of him starts wearing a suit as a bodyguard or something that could be a great story uh so yeah I mean and it's good getting Zack Ryder something to do because he wasn't doing anything he was doing jack squat I Uh, forgot he was on the roster at one point because I don't watch main event or I don't watch superstars, and apparently he's on those shows like every week. But uh, I don't watch them, so yeah. I didn't know. I didn't. I didn't know what they were or what they were doing with him or whatever. And he's he's one of my favorite personalities out off screen. He just seems like a really cool dude, and his entering work. I mean, it's average. You know what I'm saying? He does what he does very well, yeah. and. So I've always liked Zack Ryder, and I, he got himself over, which is a problem, yeah. <laughs> you know. But uh, it's one of those things. They put him with Mojo Riley, It made it fresh, and that's cool. I, I like. I like. I don't have a problem with their tag team. I like Mojo for what he did for Zack, even though like, everybody was like trying to put Zack with Mojo so he become more of a professional. But he's done more for Zach's career than vice versa. I, I think you're right, absolutely. Uh, and uh, Rhino and Heath Slater got the win. I, this has been the best Heath Slater run I think ever. It, it's best, been best storyline in the WWE right now. The only thing that would have before it, because I think eventually he will end up being on SmackDown, but I think before he had gotten there, had he showed up at an NXT event. You know, an NXT TV taping, screaming about being a free agent, and then show up at an Evolve taping, doing the same thing. Yeah, that would have been even. That would have been so much better. Yeah. I mean, I, I honestly, I haven't even thought of that. But wow, I would have. That would. I would have dug that if he showed up on NXT in the commentary role and like maybe ask Samoa Joe or someone and they're like, I need to be on here, and then, you know, job to Samoa Joe or something like that. Yeah. That would have been, yeah, that would have added so much more of a level to this storyline, even though it's already my favorite storyline. Yeah, it, it, it's great. And the whole, his, the, the people they hired to be his family. Yes. I'm, and the whole, I have two kids. I have seven kids. <laughs> How many kids you got? Um... Well, that's not important. <laughs> <laughs> and I, he Slater was a guy when I first started watching wrestling again. Um, three man band was was around, and he was so annoying in that. Uh, yeah. And so I hated just from the second I saw him, I was like, I hate this guy. 
I and mean, I was like go away heat hate kind of thing. And now I watch him. I'm like, this is, he's fantastic. I, I liked him in Social Outcasts. Yeah. And I'm enjoying the hell out of him with Rhino. And I think it's just such an odd pairing. He did so much for Bo Dallas and Curtis Axel. That he did so much for their career because they had went away. Yep. And and then they kind of went away again. So that's kind of funny. It's yeah. like. He has this energy to him. I love. I mean, I like the pairing with Rhino. I, I, I truly thought. I'm like him and Rhino are gold. I think him and Kang would have been platinum. I just that would have been like amazing to me. The the whole, especially with the whole Daniel Bryan thing, that he had history he had with Kane. I just thought they could have done a, a whole different layer with Heath and Kane and. Maybe he's trying to get advice on Daniel how to deal with Kane and that kind of thing. Okay. But but the Rhino thing is working. And, you know, because Rhino is honestly the whole him running for public office, and this is truly probably his final run with the WWE, it does add a little desperation to the character. And, you know, he has his Rhino. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. That, and I had never thought of him being with Kane, but that's that's a fascinating idea. Uh, so the show ended up with Dean Ambrose and AJ Styles doing in-ring promos, which ended with a swift kick to the nads by Mr. Styles. Uh, <laughs> I just thought I thought that was just a genius way to to kill the show. <laughs> it was just like, <laughs> yeah, it was it was a, that part was good. I thought overall the segment was a little boring. It was, um, but I've noticed lately as because a lot of times I watch these shows almost always after the fact. Mm -hmm. And sometimes by the end of it, I'm kind of tired. I'm like, okay, let's, let's get this, let's get this crap on the road. Uh, so sometimes when I get to the end of the, of the show, especially raw, especially raw. Yeah. Um, yeah, raw is a marathon. It is an endurance battle every week. (laughs) It is. So let's talk about backlash, which is later today, tonight on, uh, where is it even? Where is it happening? Um, let me look here. It is in the Richmond Coliseum in Richmond, Virginia. So a good WCW okay. country. Um, so going through this card, uh, we got The Miz taking on Dolph Ziggler for the Intercontinental Championship match. Who do you think is winning this one? I would have loved to say Dolph Ziggler just because I think that would add to the whole... I think that would add to the feud. But, uh, yeah, Dolph Ziggler is going to make The Miz look good like Dolph Ziggler does. Yeah. I'm I'm conflicted because on the one hand I think Dolph desperately needs this win, mm-hmm. and I think him having a, a run as a, as the IC champ would be great. The flip side of that though is where the Miz is going right now as champion. I would almost like to see him beat Honky Tonk Man's uh, reign. And, that would be awesome. And just do it as uh, just just continue because he is on fire right now. Um, the the only problem we're going to run into, and as time goes on, they're going to have to bring up more people, is who eventually, who are the, who's the world champion going to face? Who's the IC champion going to face? The same four people over and over and over? We're, that's going to be a problem in the long run. Yeah. Uh, next up, we've got uh, Randy Orton against Bray Wyatt. What are you thinking? I'm thinking Bray goes over. I think I Bray think, needs to go over. I think Bray needs a win for his character, and I think he needs to. Pretty, I think it had. I, I think the only way for it to happen is with Rowan doing a run in, because of course both of them lost the last time they were in a pay per view. So it's like one's going to be on a bit of a losing streak, and the way Randy would say face is if. Bray Wyatt does something crappy to win, so I'm thinking we get their run in with Eric Rowan, and they can, uh, because I kind of hate how he's disappeared. Yeah. Yeah, It's like, I really hate how he's disappeared, and he hasn't even been there with Bray, so. uh, Yeah, I think that you're probably right. I think it's a setup for something like that. Is, Is Luke Harper anywhere near returning? He's one of those people. He gives you the occasional things on uh, Twitter, so it looks like he's close. But I've heard January. You okay. know, I've heard January, but you know, they could be just trying to throw you off. Okay, so there's because if if Luke Harper showed up and helped Bray Wyatt in this match, that would be that, that would be, be fun. Nice. Um, but yeah, I think it's. I don't know, man. I'd, I'm looking forward to this match. I think it's going to be a, lo- a good match. 
I, I think Bray needs to go over because he needs to win more, but I would not be surprised if Randy won. It's just, I think that's kind of, I'm just not surprised. Uh, it, it, either way, it, I could see either happening. I think Bray needs the win, but Randy's probably going to get it because, you know, he's Randy Orton. Uh, well, then we have the Usos against the Hype Bros to get into the tag title match. Who do you think's winning here? Usos are going over with their new heel gimmick. They're going to do something hillish yep. and win. And that's awesome. Yeah. I, I dig it. And then they're going to go against Heath Slater and Rhino. What are you thinking there? I'm thinking the, the way to really get them over as heels is for the Usos to become the new tag team champions and cause Heath, Heath Slater his chance at the SmackDown, his chance at the SmackDown contract. It also extends that SmackDown contract uh, storyline, which has been the best thing on SmackDown as far as the storyline purpose. So I think the Usos become the first tag team champions. I, I think so too. I think there's going to be some shenanigans in it, and it's going to be a a kind of a fuck finish in mm-hmm. a way, and to the point where resulting in Daniel Bryan and Shane McMahon are going to give Heath Slater another chance. Yeah. I I truly believe the first tag team champions on this roster should be a real tag team. I, yeah, I agree. I agree. And, uh, and the Usos really, if you want to look at who's been around the longest, who's got the most experience, the Usos are the ones that you you pick because you don't want to, give it to say American alpha right off the bat. Cause they're brand new. And then what else are they going to do? I mean, yeah. these guys are young. Yeah. I would wait to give it to them. I'm big on, I mean, big on like many Royal rumble, WrestleMania doing it at some big event where it's been a struggle where everyone thought they were going to have like this instant success and they've really had to grind to become champions. I would prefer that. Yeah, I agree. Uh, then we have Alexa Bliss, Becky Lynch, Carmella, Naomi, Natalia, and Nikki Bella. Uh, Six-pack elimination challenge for the SmackDown Women's Championship. I thought it was interesting them adding the elimination part uh, this week. Um, but who do you think? Well, who do you think are going to be the final two? The final two, I believe, is going to be because I'm kind of playing it through my head. Who's going to eliminate who? Um, it's got to be a heel in a face. So Nikki and Carmella, and I don't like it. I don't. I think it'll be Nikki and Carmella with Nikki going over. But I honestly would prefer any of the other five. Well, actually, not Nikki, not Alexa. And the other four would work for me. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, Nikki eliminates Carmella Carmella loses her mind and causes Nikki to be eliminated, getting uh, them out of the title picture but continuing their feud. Yeah, and then if the belt ended up being Natalia beating Becky, I would be good with that. Yeah, yeah, you could I see do. that. I and I could I could see putting it on either. I think it's either going to either Natty, Becky, or Naomi are going to win. Yeah. I don't know who. I think it's pretty safe to say Alexa Bliss is not winning. Yeah. Um, I don't think Carmella is winning, um, and Nikki Bella is too much of the easy, obvious choice. So you need to keep the Carmella Nikki Bella feud going. So giving it to one of the others, um, and Natty might be a good choice. I mean, but though, if it, the one I, the person I want to win is Becky Lynch. Uh, yeah, uh, she is the person I want to win, but I do like that she's in the role of the person that never wins. And that when she actually does become the world champion, it's going to be such a bigger deal. Right. So in a way you don't have her win here because you let her win at mania or at the Royal rumble or something. Yeah. Something, one of the four majors, Yeah, just it, her, her build up. I mean, she was the one, she was the one of the four horse women that was never the NXT champion. She's never been the world champion, you know, and it's just you could build up that sympathy, you know, type thing for her. And she is so over without the belt. Yes, yeah, she so, is. She almost I, doesn't need it. She she really doesn't. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, I think that's a big thing with her is that she doesn't need the belt. So, you know, she's always going to be the one getting cheated and stuff out of it. So I kind of like them going with that whole idea maybe her and Natalia's feud continues 
maybe one more pay-per-view because i mean unfortunately with only six women you're gonna get a lot of the same type Ex- exactly until they start rating nxt which is already depleted greatly and they're <laughs> just in general <laughs> um but yeah, you one thing real quick on a side note. You mentioned you know you got your big four pay per views: your WrestleMania, Royal Rumble, Survivor Series, and SummerSlam. Is it just me? Or in the last few years, has Money in the Bank become almost more important than Survivor Series? Money in the Bank, I always say it's my favorite pay per view, other than WrestleMania, because it's going to pretty much crown a new champion. Whoever wins is going to be the new champion who they see as the future. So it's very important to me. It's always in my birthday month, and I haven't been able to make it to it. Something always comes up. It it really is. It comes from hangover from WrestleMania. WrestleMania is at the end of March, early April. I spend so much money there that (laughs) it's it's hard to turn around and go to a pay-per-view that's generally nowhere near me. Yeah, that that makes sense. Yeah, I to me I see it as like you've got your the big four and it's like number five. It is definitely five, and honestly, SummerSlams, even though they've built them up, they've stunk the last couple years. So, you know, that the last two years, I really enjoyed the entirety of SummerSlam weekend, uh-huh. um, and I think it was like this year you had. The um the the Ring of Honor show, then you had um NXT. X, NXT Takeover, and then SummerSlam, and I, I mean SummerSlam was a hit and miss show, but it had some great matches. Mm-hmm. And I think those great matches elevated the entire show, and so as a whole, I I walked out of that weekend going that was fun. The two matches I was most looking forward to on SummerSlam more than anything were the Dean Ambrose and Dolph Ziggler match, and the Sasha and Sasha and Charlotte match. And even I didn't like either one of those matches. I like how the way Sasha and Charlotte ended, but I didn't really like the match. And it might have been because Sasha was hurt with her back, but uh, it was just, it was like the match on Raw that they put on was way better. Yeah, that and, the, you're right. That and, was, that SummerSlam match was sloppy. Yeah. And there was, it was botch-tastic. Yeah, I don't know if it was because of her back. And I don't like, as big as Charlotte is, and as small as Sasha is, the whole backflip off the top to her on the ground. I mean, Sasha's supposed to catch you going at that momentum. I don't really, no, I don't like that. Yeah. I didn't like that spot. It just, it's a spot that is stuck in my brain to, you know, a month later because it was such a bad spot to be. And it's one thing when they do that spot in the at Mania when it was the triple threat. When yeah, there was you had two people, to two catch people catcher. Yeah, you're exactly right. Um, I would like to see in with all the pay per views eventually, Money in the Bank also being a super show because mm-hmm. I think having a Money in the Bank for on both shows would be good eventually. I I totally understand why they're not doing it this year. The fact that there's like what six people. I'm exaggerating. Yeah. But there's like six people on SmackDown, so you really can't have someone walking around with a briefcase. Um, but in a couple of years, I think you need to, if the brand extension goes on that long, this is a big if, but if it does, let's say it's actually successful and they do it right this time. In a few years, I think you need to make Money in the Bank a joint show, and uh, it, just because it has become so important. Um, and yeah, I just you then have the you still have the big four, but you have one other joint show. Because when they first started talking about the brand split, and I it, it didn't click in my head that every that there was going to be two pay per views a month. I just figured, oh okay, so one month Raw gets a pay per view, the next month SmackDown gets a pay per view. That makes more sense. Yeah, because that won't burn out your fans as much. It, it won't burn out your fans, and the whole idea is that each show is on the WWE Network, so the pay per views have lost their luster as it is. Right. So doing a super show every month. Seems unnecessary at this point. Exactly, exactly. Um, well, we, I mean, well, I mean by super show, I mean a pay per view. Correct. That's, yeah, that's what I mean by doing a pay per view every month. Just doesn't make any sense. Uh, I'm I'm right there with you. And there's the main event on Backlash: Dean Ambrose, the world champion, facing AJ Styles. Is this when AJ Styles finally becomes one of the few people to hold the? 
I'm probably the only person to ever hold the IWGP, TNA, and WWE World Champions. I'm going to go with a no. No? Okay. No. You think I, 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 as much as I would love it, <laughs> as much as I would mark out, geek out, or whatever, Dean Ambrose has not you no know, reached that point where he's going to lose yet. I don't think they have, people haven't started hating him yet. <laughs> so do you think there, it just continues the feud? Do you think it's kind of a, a... Yeah, I think we get it the next two pay-per-views, honestly. I I can see that. I, I What I hope is at the by the time it's all said and done, AJ Styles needs to win the belt. Yeah, uh, I agree. And one thing has been really, really great, I think, with the whole AJ Styles run, is the fact that you hear about Vince McMahon being so impressed with him. Yeah. And that the fear, I think, every wrestling fan's fear was that that Vince McMahon wouldn't know what to do with this guy, and he just doesn't wrestle in the style Vince gets. He's not a giant, but the hearing the fact that Vince McMahon is like this guy is fantastic, that is that's awesome. What uh, has helped AJ Styles is how much smaller the WWE has gotten. You have Finn Balor, Seth Rollins, Kevin Owens. You know, Cesaro is one of the larger people on the roster right now. You know, he's the big guy with Sheamus. The the champions have gotten significantly smaller. I can buy AJ beating Dean, uh, but if AJ was in uh, against, let's say, Baron Corbin, I don't think Vince would let make that work. You know, he he that wouldn't wrap around in his brain because. But he makes people look so amazing. Yeah. He's like, and that's a big thing with, you know, AJ, he gets his self over and he still gets the other guy over. Yeah, he is. I think it's, if he is not the best wrestler in the world right now, he is one of them. Uh, he He's just so incredibly impressive. And him and Kevin Owens, to me, they're, they're one in one A as far as, WWE, WWE, just because they don't have a bad match with anyone. You're right. They they just don't. And I I, I think I was looking at Sheamus and how boring his become. I was like, Sheamus needs a program with AJ Styles. He does. He can actually <laughs> make people give a crap. Yeah, and like because it's just like with certain people, they've been doing the same thing so long. They need someone to come in and just say we're going to do something different. And it's just saying AJ brought it out of, and not even really brought it out of Roman because Roman can wrestle. No, don't get me wrong, but he made everything Roman did look so strong. Yeah. You know, that whole Samoan ass kicker they've been trying to get over for years. I bought it when he did it with AJ Styles. Yes. That was, that was the best thing for Roman Reigns, that feud with AJ Styles. Yeah. He sold that Superman punch like no one does because I hate the Superman punch. Uh, as far as it looks, it looks like he's pulling back and not connecting. That's the biggest problem with the Superman punch to me. It's like so. Yeah, I, could, I, I think the best punch that I've ever seen Roman Reigns throw was that one on Miz TV, uh-huh. where he was sitting there with Miz was just talking and he just crap. Threw the punch out yeah, of nowhere type he thing. Did. That was yeah. a, that yeah. looked like. I mean, he he connected that. Oof. That was brutal, and yeah. Poor. Speaking of Roman Reigns, poor because we're going to talk about Raw now. Uh, we might not go as detailed into Raw as as we did with SmackDown, but Roman Reigns is, in a way, I feel bad for the guy because he keeps getting shit on by the fans. His he's not a bad wrestler. He's actually no, pretty good. He he's. I think if they would just let him be himself, he would be a better talker. I saw some of those those clips from when he was in his suit in NXT before they did the Shield thing. He was actually pretty good at that, mm-hmm. um, and so he he's got to get out. He's got he needs to get new ring gear. That's got to change because um, it just I, the yeah it, that's got to change. And there was I forget which match it was that there was maybe it was that it was a multi man match that it was the one for where Kevin Owens won the title. Mm-hmm. Um, at one point, Kevin Owens went and did the you know the the backhand chop on on uh, Reigns and it hurt his hand. Uh, no, no, um, Owens did it onto Reigns onto his uh. his plate thing that he wears, yeah. and he he was like, "Damn, that hurt!" And it was just a one of those funny little Owens moments 
yeah. where he does something and he reacts just in ways no one else does. Uh, but that that flak jacket thing's got to go. That is that's awful. Um, so, do you want to go all the way through all of Raw, or do you just want to talk about your your overall thoughts about it? Oh uh, yeah, I was say I can hit the high spots. Okay, um, yeah. What were your... um, Kevin Owens and Chris Jericho? I think that's going to be amazing. Uh, I really did think Kevin Owens came out and. And I love I, uh, Kevin Owens came out. He did his thing, and he was very much his smarky Kevin Owens self. And I, I, I dug it, and I love that they didn't bring Triple H out. That was amazing to me. I, I just thought they were going to come and shove it down your throat with Triple H. And the fact that they didn't bring him out and they've only acknowledged him, it, it keeps his hit the storyline a mystery. And I felt like Raw has been missing uh, an encompassing storyline for the whole show, because I mean it's a three-hour show. You got to have a way to tie it all. To- Over the first few months of Raw, there's been nothing to tie it together. Now you have this overarching Kevin Owens is 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 Triple H coming back? What was Triple H's plan? It's to the uh, so much to the show. I when I heard your show last week for the people who listened last week, you brought up that whole idea of the four horsemen type thing with Kevin Owens. Right. That was really amazing. I thought that was a really great idea. And I you said a Tommy, I was like, I I just like Trish Chris Jericho in that character. Uh as far as and then bring in uh my favorite uh my favorite tag team, the revival, as his as his group and I just think that would just be because they're all such great talkers and they're all such great heels that I think that would add so much to it. But I do look forward to what they're going to do with the whole Chris Jericho and Cole Kevin Owens thing. Um, it's, I mean, honestly, we're always mainly forgettable. The whole Charlotte slapping Dana Brooke thing doesn't make any sense to me yeah, because no. Dana Brooke has no character. I mean, I mean, she she actually let me say this. I love her on the mic, and I love her. She can't wrestle, so I know they're not. They, they can't be bringing building up a Charlotte Dana Brooke match. No one would want to see that. No, not at all. The Bo Dallas against the enhancement talent. That was the first time with an enhancement talent that it actually made sense because they're kind of changing his character. So him working with an enhancement talent actually made sense. Yeah. Uh, um, now I heard a rumor that that is just a temporary thing that he's going to be facing somebody at some, in some tour somewhere and they want to make him look, you know, kind of credible to get jobbed out to this other dude. Yeah, uh, he's going to fight in China against Bing Wang. Okay. Uh, and, uh, the new Chinese guy that they signed. His first match is going to be on the WWE China. So okay. they were trying to build Bo Dallas up as a badass. So, you know. See, I, I love Bo Dallas. I, I, the, when Bo Dallas got kicked out of NXT... And he had that breakdown and was running around and the cops were grabbing him and taking him out. That was one of the funniest things I have ever seen in my entire life. Yeah. Uh, and, and that the po- when he kept wait, he would, he kept walking out before he had the breakdown and he was, when he, he there was, he was on the stage and he was like going back and forth to the audience. He walked out and he kept coming back. He is as that character he is amazing. He is so funny. And there was a point when I was, he was starting to grow like his goatee out. And I didn't know if they were thinking about putting him with the Wyatts, which I thought to myself, put him with the Wyatts, but don't change anything about his character. Keep him the same, but with the Wyatts would have been hilarious. Uh, I love Bo. I hate the singlet that he's wearing. That looks awful. Um, I don't know if he's just not in quite as good shape as he was. Uh, not that I can talk because I'm a fatty, but I, I, yeah, I, they just don't. I think Bo Dallas is one of those guys that that Vince McMahon looks at and goes, "I don't get it." Yeah, I, I don't. I, I when I saw him on NXT, and I am a, not a necessarily. A, I'm not a body guy, but I am when it comes to if it seems like it's a hindrance to your character, and he doesn't look like a wrestler to me. And he doesn't look like a wrestler that would be successful. So I'm like, something about your, something about you has to change. 
Maybe he cuts his hair. Maybe maybe he does add a little muscle or whatever. But something about his character has to change because when I look at him, he doesn't have the look. I mean, I look at him, I just like I I don't want to pay to see you wrestle. But he wrestles. He's a really good wrestler. Just I nothing special about him. Yeah, I see. I'm. I look at him. I'm like, oh, it's your dad with long hair. Uh, and you know, Mike Rotunda had a hell of a career. Overall, he, he was he was never a main eventer, but he he had a hell of a career. So his look, I mean, his his hair really is stringy. Maybe he needs to do something different with his hair. Uh, but he, his personality is what I love. He yeah. cracks me up, um, and I hate that they have just not been able to do much with him. But yeah, him with a jobber that made sense. And I do like the fact that they are using uh, enhancement talent. Um, on Raw, because yeah. uh, and they probably need to start doing it on SmackDown, uh, since they have like six people. But on Raw, you've got so much time to fill. Might as well let you know, let these people, especially these people you're rehabbing, let them get over. Let them, as uh, a Solomon Monster said on his show, the the one of the big points with enhancement talent is it helps to get a person's moves over. So you see how devastating a move is which would work with Nia Jax if they would actually let her pick a move. Her finisher is supposed to be a Samoan drop into a power slam. She can't pull it off. Oh, and that's... Uh, dude, she... Oh, awful. She did a Death Valley Driver one time that was okay. She can... Uh, Nia Jax... She is also... She seems like a super nice person. She just seems like a really sweet lady. But she is not ready. She, not at all. She is not ready. Dana Brooke is not ready. Dana Brooks ready to be a manager. They her, put it with the club. I'm okay with it. Yeah, her. Oh God, her is a mouthpiece for the club. Not that they need a mouthpiece, but um, and she, her with Emma in NXT was so good, and it sucks that Emma got hurt because I think they would still be together. Um, yeah, she is so good on the mic, uh, but so so bad in the ring, and I know she had an injury and. Something she hasn't been the same because I hasn't. thought when she first started in NXT she was pretty good. Yeah, and it's just like she has regressed somehow. And she was so athletic. Yeah, and I mean she you, she came out she looked ripped all the way. Now she comes out and, and I'm not a body shamer at all. I'm not judging, but something is different. And it's like she's not working out like she used to. She's not ripped like she used to be. They um, occasionally ask women to have more of a softer appearance if they think they're too ripped. Okay. And, and I would not be surprised if that happened with her. Uh, and I'm not a body shamer, but if you're in a profession where your body is a part of your job, I mean, and wrestling is um, wrestling is acting, you know. Right. And so your appearance is a part of your job. I don't feel like me saying you're fat or you're skinny or you need to get a little more ripped, I don't feel like that's insensitive or body shaming because it's an appearance-based business. Right. Because your your whole job is to walk out in front of hundreds, if not thousands of people in essentially a swimsuit or underwear. Yes. I'm not telling someone that works in customer service that they need to lose weight that's on the phone. I'm telling someone that makes money off of their body. If they didn't look the way they did, they would have never gotten a job. Right. Like the, uh, oh, God, who's that guy in, in Ring of Honor that brings in the keg of beer? Um, that gigantic fat man. Oh, my God. Oh, man, I can't think of his name. And that guy, but that guy can move. Yeah. I mean, that that dude is fat. Yeah. And he, he is not not attractive to look at and in any way, shape, or form. It kind of hurts your eyes. Bless his heart. Uh, but I digress. Anyway, so yeah, my my only um, my kind of highlights from from Raw. Well, I thought the Kevin uh, Kevin Owens stuff was fantastic. Uh, Chris Jericho is fantastic, and I had never thought of of my Four Horsemen idea having Jericho in there. I think that would be that would also work. I just I kind of liked the where I was coming from is is it, and almost in a way back to they used to talk about the NXT five. You know, Owens, Zayn. Uh, um, Finn uh, Balor, Atami, and uh, Neville, uh-huh. and those were kind of those were those were Triple H's guys, 
And uh, it would have been cool at some point for them to have been a faction. And you could still do something in the future where you could have them standing up against some of the old guard or the chosen few people. But so when I thought of a Tommy with Owens in this new role, I thought that would be the ode to that. Exactly. Plus, I think him as a silent assassin, not that he can't talk, but his English has gotten a lot better. Uh, But I think him just coming in and looking like and not because he's Asian, but almost he's the ninja of the group and he's going to hurt you. He fits that role. He just even though he's very, you know, he's a hobbit. He looks intimidating like he will he will F you up. I saw a gif of him from uh, Ring of Honor uh, uh, giving a, a GTS to uh, to Seth Rollins, Tyler Black at the time, and it looked like he knocked some teeth out. He he knocked his ass out. I mean, it was cold. Done. I love, I love that they gave him his move back. They gave both his moves back. He got his running knee, uh-huh. and he got the GTS, and I think that, that's that's fantastic. Um, so that's why I kind of thought of, of a Tommy, but I think... Um, you know Jericho in there would be good, and bringing up the revival. Who I I with you. I love the revival. At first, I didn't like them because you know they were they were a job team. They mm-hmm. kind of like Blake and Murphy were a job team, and then they got kind of a fluke win. Uh, but then they turned their personalities on, and if, if the whole time I'm like, you guys just really want to be Arn Anderson and Tully Blanchard, and you're just bad knockoffs. <laughs> They came out with the jackets on, and I was like, man, they look very Brain Busters-ish. Yep. And I saw where they were going with the character, and it was funny because I had met them at WrestleMania 31, and it was doing the Hall of Fame, and they had a NXT, uh, the, the NXT group, and no one was in their line. And I met them, I they signed my thing, and I got a picture with them, and they're like, we're going to be tag team champions. They told me that. And I was like, hmm. And I was like, no, nah, you're not. You're both like 5'10 at the tallest. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have a look. You're not ripped. You no, know, the WWE hates you. And then they've gotten themselves over so well. And they're so good. And yeah, it's, they, are. they are. And you listen to you listen to podcasts all over the place. And a lot of times the general consensus in the last six months have been the two best tag teams in all of professional wrestling are the Revival and American Alpha. Yes. And, and yeah, and then you had their match against um you know Johnny Gargano and Tommaso Ciampa which was phenomenal and they told probably, such a great story in that match. Probably the best tag team match I've seen in 10 years. Easily. Yeah, I could I could go with that cuz you've got you know you've got uh Tommaso and and Johnny are fantastic together yeah. and you know they're slowly planting the seeds for the Tommaso Ciampa heel turn. Oh, the Psycho uh, Killer is coming. Oh, it is. It's going to be so good. Uh, but And Johnny Gargano is, I mentioned this last week on the show, he is the perfect baby face. You he know, is. He is like Sami Zayn and Bailey. He is that, I think he's going to be a megastar. I can see if, if, unless his size just completely hampers it with this cruiserweight division, which one of the highlights I thought was the v- cruiserweight vignette. Uh, of the last two weeks where anytime I'm watching WWE television, especially Monday Night Raw, and I see freaking Cedric Alexander on there, I'm losing my mind. I'm like, that's fantastic. Cedric Alexander on WWE TV. He's my favorite in the CW. He was my favorite in the CWC as far as my favorite wrestler. Oh, yeah. I'm. He was mine as well. Uh, it, uh, yeah, he's just... Uh, and I first, I first discovered him... Um, I found a match, it was a PWX match that he had with AJ Styles, I think in 2014, and I found it on YouTube, and it's amazing. It's just so good, and it was like my third favorite match of the year, that year. Uh, second, might have been second or third, it, um, and I just, so I've been a fan of his ever since. I loved his work in Ring of Honor. I even liked his heel turn and his, his him with Veda Scott. I thought it was great. It added a new dynamic to his character. His work in in the Cruiserweight Classic has been fantastic. That match with Kota Ibushi, it's that's going to be one of the you know that's in top ten match of the year. Yeah, definitely easily. The whole afterwards, him cry, you know him in tears, uh, the crowd chanting, "Please sign Cedric." Triple H coming out, giving the thumbs up. Oh. 
man. And if I'm really hoping that the WWE learns from the mistakes of WCW, I know I'm asking a lot here. I know I am, but let's learn from the mistakes of WCW and use the cruiserweight division as a leapfrog point. Is all they have to do is look to to New Japan, look at the success of Kenny Omega, who started out as a junior. He dominated the juniors, and he moved up and is now in the um, in the main event picture. And, and the yeah. fact that they um, gave you know Finn Balor, who is legitimately a cruiserweight, mm-hmm. the main title right off the bat shows that things are different. And I, I think you can all of the changes as far as body type and whatnot. All you can point that straight back to CM Punk and Daniel Bryan. That, Definitely, those two changed the way. WWE looks at things. Um, so I think someday we could hopefully, if they do it right, you could see a Cedric Alexander, a Johnny Gargano in the main event. Um, and I would just love that. But, uh, but yeah, so the, I'm really looking forward to the to the Cruiserweight division. That was one of the best things Monday Nitro had going for it. Real quick, do you yeah. think Neville's going to go Cruiserweight? I think he should. Yeah, because, I mean, I feel like he's in a Runt right now. Oh, he is, and that's the saddest thing is 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 he is so he's so good, so good, and so good. I mean, he's never been one of my favorite wrestlers. Don't get me wrong, but that doesn't mean I don't now acknowledge how talented he is. Yes. His his run as NXT champion was fantastic. Him, him and Tyson Kidd were some of my favorite oh, matches. God, those were good. His the match where he finally lost to Sami Zayn was my favorite match that year. I was in tears at the end of that. It was so incredible. Um, so yeah, I think he needs because he needs a rehab. Um, I'm, I was really surprised that Kalisto was moved, put on SmackDown because I thought for sure they would have put him in the cruiserweight division. Yeah, yeah, and then Sin Cara is on Raw. That completely didn't make any sense to me. No, Sin Cara just needs to go away. He sucks. He see that's the whole thing. I don't think he sucks. I just think. Okay, I mean, he's you're right. A pretty good wrestler. But... To be fair, he can he can go in the ring it, at times. He's real hit and miss. He's right. either a botch fest or he is great. That one of those last ladder matches, I can't remember if it was Money in the Bank or WrestleMania a couple years ago. He was in a ladder match for something, and he did some really cool, crazy ass spots. He can he can work. It's just like I said, he's stuck with this in character, car character, and it's just. It was one of those things. It was Triple H's character, and it was like one of his first uh, first big signings, and he's trying to make it work, and I'm just like, let it go. Yeah, and, he, and he's, he's Sin Cara 2.0 yeah. for Pete's sake. Eh, just I'm, I'm yeah. done with him. Hun- I liked him better as Hanako. I thought he was funnier. Yeah. Uh, so, so, yeah, so I think Neville does go into, into the Cruiserweights. So um, Cruiserweights, the classic this week, so it's a good segue. Uh, there were two matches. We had uh, Zack Saber Jr. against uh, Noam Dar and fuck, what was the other one? Um, <laughs> I forgot. Uh, T.J. Perkins uh, no. against Rich Swan. Yeah. So I have not actually had a chance to really watch these. I saw the end of the Zack Saber Noam Dar yeah, match. No- yeah, that was a technical classic match. I mean, it was. I, I would say it would be like William Regal and Dean Malenko having a match. Uh, they put on a they put on a clinic. Okay. Uh, there was this um, there was a spot where they were both trying to put people each other in cross arm breakers, and I just thought that was brilliantly done because they were both technical submission wrestlers. And the move the move that actually ended the match uh, it, it was kind of a Ring of Saturn thing, and how he pulled it off, it looked like he actually hurt him. And then and, and it was like it was so well done. Uh, I, I've become I went I went from not knowing really who Zack Saber Jr. was. I heard him. Uh, I saw a few of his posts on Becky Lynch and the English wrestlers uh, pages. They were saying was so happy for him. And I went from not knowing who he was to him probably being one of my favorite technical wrestlers, M- maybe one of my favorite wrestlers. I'm just gonna have to see him a little bit more. But, uh, yeah, he's putting on amazing matches, and he's, he's like paper thin. It's kind of, he's so. He is so skinny. He is skinny. so like, lanky. Yeah. And, yeah. 
So the the sad thing is, though, is he's not signing with WWE. He's uh, not. Yes, no. he can't. Right. I don't know if it's a he can't. I, I don't know if if he if his Rev Pro contract is preventing him from from signing. Um, and I don't know how much of it is he just doesn't want to give up the freedom of doing the indies. Um, it, but that's also like Kota Ibushi is not signing. And he is. No, that last I heard, he was not. Um, he had made comments about he is, he still has um, things in Japan. He wants to do, wants to take care of. He has unfinished business in Japan. Okay. Uh, so yeah, as of right now, the ones that are sticking around um, are T.J. Perkins, Grand Metallic. Um, I think Tony Nice might be because he was on NXT this week. Um, Crap! There was a list, and I forgot. I've already forgotten who they are. Uh, obviously, yeah. I thought Abushi, I, I I truly picked Abushi to win the tournament. I mean, like from the first day, I thought it, everything was going towards him winning the tournament. Yeah, I, I think it was most most people I've heard of have said either they thought Zack Saber Junior. or Abushi was going to win. So, uh, so this makes this coming Wednesday very interesting. We've got. Grand Metallic taking on Zack Sabre Jr. I've been really impressed with Grand Metallic. He's had some... His match with Tozawa... Oh, Tozawa has signed. Okay. Yeah. His match with Tozawa was fantastic. Oh, that, that whole show. That that episode, him against Tozawa and... and uh, God, who was the other? That was the Brian Kendrick Kota Ibushi match. Yes. Holy crap. Those were so good. Uh, Ozawa has the best German suplex since I've seen since... Chris Benoit. Oh yeah, so, yeah. oh yeah. He he will be the tenth mayor of Suplex City. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. Kendrick is sticking around, so Kendrick is going to be in the division, uh, and then of course Gargano and Chapa are sticking around. Though well, they're already been signed. And my understanding is that all of these guys are also going to be at the same time working in NXT. Because they're yeah, from what I understand, they're not going to travel with Raw as much. Like, only a few of them will travel every week, but the other groups will go back to NXT. Which I think is a good idea. I mean, it'll keep the division fresh that way, Uh and it will be a really good way to help bolster NXT. Because, yeah, even though these guys are less than 205 pounds, you've got a lot of folks in here who are truly potentially future world champions. You've got a hell of a group of people here. Um, and Cedric Alexander is obviously sticking around, so I think it's uh, it's I'm really looking forward to Wednesday. So yeah, Grand Metallic against Zack Saber Jr. Who do you think's winning this? Um, with the I'm gonna go with Zack Saber Jr. Yeah, and then we've got Kota Ibushi against T.J. Perkins. I think T.J.P. comes up with the upset in that one. Yeah, I I think had Ibushi and Saber both signed, I think the finals would have been Ibushi versus Saber. Definitely. I, I definitely believe that. Um, but, yeah, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if T.J. Perkins wins the whole thing. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if the last match was T.J. Perkins against Grand Metallic. But I think you almost have to have either Sabre or Ibushi in there. Uh, to give it credibility, you right. know, to me. It's just you, I mean, when you clearly have one and two probably the better better cruiserweights in the world, you need your champion to beat one of them. Yeah. And even just I would just say these these guys are great wrestlers. Yeah. You could you could put these guys in hell most of the most of the folks in this tournament. There are a few duds, but most of these folks in this tournament, you could you put them in there with Seth Rollins or Finn Balor or or Dolph Ziggler or AJ Styles and you're getting great matches. That is true. I, I completely agree with that. Yeah. And so, it's like, yeah, I've I've enjoyed C W C as much as I've enjoyed anything, uh, like in wrestling, period, and forever, I I don't I, I like I said I just think it's different that it's all about wrestling, yeah. and it's like you haven't dealt with that in a very very long time where it is just pure wrestling, and these guys are amazing at what they do. I agree. I think this is one of the best things WWE has ever done. Yeah, and I hope they do it. I am very big on them. I hope I'm, I know every year you can't crown a cruiserweight champion, but I hope they do it every year, and I hope they get really good at bringing in indie guys, not necessarily ones that are going to stay. And 
do it like that. Yeah, and that's what's been so fun about this is it was with the exception of, you know, um of Gargano, Ciampa and Swan, these are people that you have not seen regularly <laughs> on any WWE TV. Um so it's you don't know who's sticking around. Yeah. And they pulled in some of the biggest names in indie wrestling. Period. I it, so Yeah, Sid asked for his release from ROH so he could be in this. Exactly. That, and, yeah. and that was like the craziest risk to me. Yeah, and I loved that Mauro Ronaldo mentioned that on commentary. Yeah, uh, he even say he, he he gave up a lucrative contract with Ring of Honor to come here. I thought that was great. And the Mauro Ronaldo and Daniel Bryan as a a a team doing the announcing have been just amazing. Um, but so at the end of it, they're going to get this trophy. Do you think the winner will be then crowned the next week on Raw as the Cruiserweight Champion? Yeah, they actually announced that about a month ago. Oh, they did? Okay. Now, I've seen some mock-ups of a Cruiserweight belt that is essentially the same belt as the women's belt and the world belts, but in purple. Yeah. Have you seen that? Yes, and I just think that's people just being, you know, kind of debaggish about it, but I actually like the belt. I did too. <laughs> that they mocked up. I've actually liked it. That's the sad part about it is that I actually like it. You know, and it's funny, like IWGP, their belts are pretty much the same. The junior belt is just smaller than the heavyweight belt. You right. Know? And so the, it's like there's nothing wrong with the belts looking similar. I know. I agree. I'm right there with you. It gives a certain cachet, I think, to the whole thing. Yeah. Um. So so yeah, that will it it will be interesting to see who they bring in. Um, but yeah, I, I'm with you. I think this is one of the coolest things I've I've ever watched, and it's been so much fun. And I'm really looking forward to having a you know, if they do it well, having a good hour of Raw every week being nothing but great wrestling. Yeah. Um, because I I don't know if they're going to open the show with it. If they follow the you know the Nitro formula, then um, we're we're in for a treat. We really are. They just need to not screw up where WCW screwed up. And when these guys get to the point when they're ready to move on and up, let them move on and move up. I'm very, the one thing that does bother me, and I will say this, is that I don't think Michael Cole can pull off calling the matches. Oh, geez. If Michael Cole doesn't have Vince McMahon screaming in his ear, he might. Is mm. If we get Michael Cole that called uh, Beast in the East. Yeah. Uh, then that could be okay. If we get the Michael Cole that doesn't know the difference between a head scissor takeover and a hurricane rana, yeah. then we're in trouble. He, speaking of which, that son of a bitch blocked me. I asked him, please learn the difference between a hurricane rana and a head scissor takeover, and he blocked me. I'm like, really? Yeah. It's, not, it's not that hard. And how many times has he called a... Um, Oh god, now I'm blanking on it. He miscalls Mishinoku drivers all the time, or he yeah. calls other things Mishinoku yeah. drivers. Driver Falcon Arrow, he calls the Mikinoku driver. Yeah. Um, the Blue Thunder Bomb, he's called yeah. it. It, it. He calls he calls everything Sami Zayn does the Blue Thunder Bomb. Yeah, he does. It's so bad. But the the best part though is is sometimes um, Corey Graves will just correct him, uh-huh. uh, and which I've I, Corey Graves is great. Yeah. I just I can't say enough good things. My, I am so upset that he's not a wrestler. If he was a wrestler, he would probably be my favorite one. I never saw his in ring work, so I don't know how he was in the ring. I mean, he was okay in the ring, but his his gimmick, his confidence with the way he speaks, he literally makes you hate him. <laughs> he's so good. He's if so good. We need, they need to get rid of him. They need to get rid of JBL. It's it's just it's atrocious at this point. Well, see the whole thing with JBL and and Otunga, I think they're miscast right now. Uh, JBL has such a natural heel manager type vibe right now, mm-hmm. uh, where it, he could do something like the Layfield family as far as the Heenan family, and it would get over a lot of people that couldn't talk. Uh, and and if that's not what you want to do, you want someone younger that can really still bump. You go with a Tonga, who 
very much you could have the swarmy because he's married to Jennifer Hudson type thing. You can do swarmy that he's using her for his money and he's using that to buy wrestlers type thing. I just think those two are so good at talking and they have such a natural heel thing about them that it would help. And I just think right now the WWE, I'm not saying everybody needs to be with Paul Heyman. I'm not that guy, but managers are missing right now because people can't get themselves over. I agree. I could. And I think that's a great idea. I'd never thought of that. Um, well, let's, we're going to start wrapping things up here in a sec, but let's do talk about NXT. And then I know you watch TNA, which I don't, but I want to get your thoughts on what's going on right now on TNA. Okay. Um, NXT is, you can definitely tell is in a state of flux right now. They've lost a lot of people. Uh, and they're trying to rebuild. And so, like, we got this match this week, uh, TM61 against Tony Nese and uh, Ari Davari. Um, nice got a really big pop, I thought. And, really good wrestler. Yeah. I thought this was um, uh, this was actually a fun match. Uh, I, TM61 or 6-1 or whatever their damn name is, the, the two things always stick out with me. One is that one of the guys looks just like Alex Wright. Okay. And, I agree with that. And the other one is, and I, I, I mentioned this, I don't know if it was last week or the week before, but every time the announcers say Nick Miller, I think of New Girl. Because, <laughs> because his name is because, Yeah, and, and I get that, that the, sad, the sad Nick Miller song <laughs> stuck in my head. And so, uh, so yeah, that, but I think they're a good tag team. They just, yeah, something's not quite clicking yet, and I don't... Yeah. I don't know what it is. It, it sucks that they couldn't keep the the uh, mighty don't kneel name, even though they kept the catch catchphrase. Yeah, they kept the catchphrase, and I think they should call the finisher that. Yeah, yeah, good call. That I mean, that's and that's a pretty cool finisher. I just can't see them doing that to the uh... anybody that weighs a significant amount. Yeah, so they're gonna need <laughs> they're gonna need something else. Yeah, because, like, let's say they're in that match with the Authors of Pain. They yes. can't do that to them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and just... the, the Authors of Pain, I'm not sure what to think about these guys. They, are they, do, are they, is it Spanish that they're talking when they're screaming in the ring? Because it's not English. I don't know what the hell they're saying. I think it's like, I think it's like Tongan. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, so they're Tongan. I okay. believe so. I don't don't quote me. I know nothing about these two dudes. Very rarely, again, <laughs> that this happens. But it's just it just seems when they're screaming, that's what I thought they were screaming. But it might be Spanish. I don't know. I've never okay. like tried to isolate the sound. They did a really really good job of making sure no one knows who they are. Yeah, that they did. I I, I agree with you there. Um, and it adds so much to their character, the mystery. And the fact that Paul uh, Paul Ellering is yeah. their manager, I think it's great. Um, so yeah, other than that, we had uh, Ember Moon have a match against uh, Leah Vaughn, whose apparently name on the Indies is Leah Vaughn, just Vaughn spelled differently. I had to look that up. Uh, Ember Moon, I, th- this I don't know. This, she, Ember Moon's good, and I think she, and she's different. She's she's, yes. she's a high flying. Diva and I, I, I dig it. I dig that she's different. I and, do too. And, and she doesn't play uh, a stereotypical black character. Yes. And and that's a big deal with me as far as with um, or African American athletes. Me being African American, I hate that they all play the same character. So she's got this whole mystery, almost war wolf dress, I guess, type of thing mystic type thing and I, I dig it yep. because it's different than anything I've seen and her finisher is amazing yeah her finisher is amazing It. the only thing I fear is that if, if Hogan screwed up his back after giving that pathetic leg drop for so many years how messed up is she going to be after doing that move yeah it, 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 um, long term effect on her body is going to suck women's careers unfortunately I mean, are you generally shorter than men's just because, you know, they generally want to do other things. So. Right. Um, so hopefully she, she doesn't do it to the point where it, it hurts her, and hopefully she has a secondary move. Yeah. Because that's one of those moves that you almost don't want to bust that out every match because it is impressive. Um, what else happened? We had, we had a lot of backstage vignettes. There was a really good revival vignette. Uh, Noe Jose had a pretty good backstage interview. What do you think about him? Um, he's 
the energy guy. I think he has a purpose. I think he works. His work is solid, and he's got the. He's gonna never be world champion, but he's always gonna have a spot because his music is so over. It gets everyone dancing, and then he just has that big smile and that energy. And I just like he's always gonna have a spot. I can see that. Yeah, that the one episode where where he got Corey Graves and Tom Phillips to start dancing was hilarious. Uh, I enjoyed that. Um, but yeah, he and he is actually a, a surprisingly good worker. Because when I first saw him, I just kind of rolled my eyes and thought, "Oh God." Uh, and I, I pretty much hate anyone because his first finisher was the wind up punch, and I'm I really do hate anyone that uses a finish a punch as a finisher. I mean, I know it can work with certain people, but I think the only way it does work is if you just legit punch the person as hard as you can. Yeah. There was a guy and whose name I am completely blanking on back in the NWA. Uh, Ron Garvin. Thank you. He had a great punch. Yeah, the hands, because he used to just punch people. <laughs> he did. I mean, like, if you read any biography where he's mentioned, he would just punch you. <laughs> that was his hands of stone was him punching you in the face. <laughs> I had to say his win when he won the title against Ric Flair, even mm-hmm. though learning you know about it years later that it was it was they just wanted to get the title off Flair so he could rewin it at at um at Starcade and that's why everyone was like nope I'm not gonna do that and he was like I'll do it um so that kind of diminishes that but I, I I loved him at the time I thought Ron Garvin was great uh but. But back, we had some uh, Tomasa Champa talking uh, with a trainer backstage, and you can tell he's got the angry seeds going. Yeah. Um, then we had Andrade Cien Almas against uh, Austin Aries. Is it just me, or is there something about Almas not clicking? Um, I, I feel almost the same way as I feel about Apollo, as he really doesn't have a character. I mean, his character is that he wears a hat. Which he didn't wear this week, thank God. So that kind of took away from his character. He had a hat and suspenders, man. That was his character. And it's just, I don't, I, like I said, I, I think he can work. And I think he has a great Lucha style. Don't get me wrong. It's just, right now, he doesn't have a character. Uh, the, the head writer of NXT for, like, all the years when NXT was amazing is now the head writer of SmackDown. Oh, no wonder so, SmackDown is good. So <laughs> NXT is just it's there's no storylines. Yeah. There's nothing going on with it. And I just I honestly find it it's only an hour, that's why it's not too difficult to watch, but I kinda find it difficult to watch. I, I can see that. Especially with Asuka and Shinsuke doing mic work, which their English is okay, but they don't know how to put the inflections on the right words right now. So it's kinda like struggling to because I think Asuka seems like she's going closer to heel. The character she's playing right now, but... Yeah, she, yeah. she's a... I think she's a tweener. Yeah. Um, but she's also legit, like, I... If she got in a real fight with almost anyone, with the exception of probably Brock Lesnar, I'm thinking she's going to win. Yeah, she's an MMA fighter. I mean, she has an MMA record. Yeah, because as you just look at her, you're like, okay, yep, she's going to fuck you up. Yeah, real bad. Yeah. She probably uh, she probably beat up CM Punk. Which, uh, well, hey, I don't <laughs> know. He could probably take me. Oh I'm God, not, I know he would take me. Yeah, I'd love to say he could probably take me. I'm not. I, I, uh, I like I said, I, I definitely wish him the best in his future endeavors. But uh, when it came down to it, I mean, you you're fighting people that have been fighting all their lives. As opposed to you have put in two years of work, so I didn't think it was going to work out for him that way. Yeah. No, and he, I, I actually, I watched the fight this morning, and yeah, me too. He, oh, poor guy. He, he looked, was he was so gracious, he, which was he great. Completely out of place. I mean, there's nothing you could be other than humble when you get beat like that. It wasn't even close. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and luckily Mickey Gall wasn't a dick about it. He was really, he was actually pretty humble uh, and yeah. gracious about it too. Which was being a twenty-four-year-old kid who you know could be just arrogant out of beyond belief. But yeah, that was uh, that was a pretty brutal, um, brutal beatdown, and he got a cauliflower ear out of it. Oh man, that that's got to suck. Because 
But we'll see if he has another fight. I, I'm with you. I, I wish him the best of luck. I I really wish he hadn't. It's like on the one hand, especially after listening to the interview, the Colt Cabana interviews. I, I kind of, I definitely see where he's coming from. He got treated like crap, I think, in a lot of ways, and he was given a lot of promises that weren't fulfilled. Um, and he's just, in general, an angry guy. And so yeah. you, you get angry, disenfranchised guy dealing with someone like Vince McMahon. That's not going to end well. I, uh, I was with him after the Colt interview, and I was with him for his reason to leave. And I was, like, really excited. I mean, you can look at posts and show how excited I was that he was going to MMA World. And I was wishing him the best. I didn't know if he was going to be good or bad. I was just going to support him no matter what. He then went on some kind of rant about being the best wrestler means being the best at a phony world doesn't mean anything and how wrestling doesn't matter. And I heard that interview and I'm like, I I mean, it was a video. He said it. It wasn't someone reporting that he said it. It that just completely, completely made me. Uh, through with him because the only reason he can get in the MMA shot, the only reason he is who he is is because of wrestling and the wrestling fans. And it's just like to kind of crap on wrestling as a as an activity or as a form of entertainment when it has made your dreams come true kind of annoyed me. I understand yeah. it came from an angry person now and I can kind of get over it to a point but that, I mean, I was a huge CM Punk person. So to me, for him to say, and the one thing I loved about him is how much he loved the business. And for him to kind of crap on the business, that kind of hurt me. Yeah. he. I think it was a perfect storm. He was angry. He was bitter. I mean, he, he had a medical condition that was grossly misdiagnosed um, by apparently idiot doctors that can get some things right, but not others. Uh, and I think it was it was a combination of bitterness and sour grapes. Um, and he also he was very successful. Yeah, if, without wrestling, he wouldn't be where he is. He'd be like you said on that that post you did on Facebook. He'd be a, the dude who worked at the comic book shop. No, wait, was that that was either you or Joey Numbers? But you basically yeah. you guys both said something along the same lines. Yeah. Um. Because, yeah, without it, he'd, he'd be working in a comic book shop. Not if there's anything wrong with that. I love the guys at my local comic book shop. They're great. But he, uh... Oh, where's it going? Don't, don't, I'm just saying, don't alienate the people who made you who yeah, you Yeah, exactly. And, and I like, and that's, I'm like, I'm not saying hard work and being talented didn't get them a lot of worries, but wrestling, wrestling, because it is... Because it is a scripted environment, because it's like a plays, it is so much fan driven. Yeah, exactly. So. And the thing I think that, yes, it's scripted, but I think honestly, if you compare MMA and boxing and professional wrestling, as far as in the long run, doing which career does more damage to a person's body, I think that professional wrestling does the worst especially someone working in WWE because they're working what three nights a week, three, four nights a week, at least doing matches. Yeah, it's scripted, but you're still falling on your head. Um, and when you're a boxer, you have months off in between fights. When you're an MMA fighter, you have months off in between fights. So I, I think that, I think boxing is probably worse for you than, than MMA because of this, all the constant straight shots to the head and MMA refs are much quicker to end fights just to say, no, this dude's done than mm-hmm. boxing refs are. Um, but I really think that all things considered, uh, it is a lot harder to be a professional wrestler and they don't get the credit for that. Yeah. The, the, the hard work that these, these guys and girls do, the, the toll they put on their bodies, it is crazy. Um, so and yeah, they, I think it's harder to be a great great professional wrestler than it is to be a great MMA fighter and a great uh, boxer because it's so much of stuff is out of your control when it becomes a great wrestler. Exactly. And, yeah, so much stuff is I mean, like, because think about uh, wrestlers that you can say they're great in the ring, great in the, great on the mic, 
you know, great at selling, and, you know, everything that's involved with being wrestlers, it's a handful, maybe, that are great at everything. You know, like, Cesaro is one of the best in-ring workers in the world. I wouldn't even put him in the top 100 as far as on the mic, you know? He's, I mean, he's a great in-ring performer, but if you look at the whole body of work, he's not necessarily great at everything, so... It is rare when you meet when you have somebody in wrestling that's really great at everything. Hulk Hogan was a shit in ring performer. Oh, he was but, terrible. Yeah, he was a shit in ring performer, but he could get over on the mic. Yeah. So I wouldn't like when they say top five wrestlers all the time. He he's never in my top five. But it's just that's why it's so much more difficult. Yeah, I I, I agree with you there. And you know, the interesting thing about Hogan is. Apparently he had a run in Japan where he actually had really good matches. Yeah. And you could always tell if if you're watching a Hogan match and it was a good match, that meant he was about to job. Yep. The only exception to that is that match with Sting at Starcade. And that was because he screwed Sting over on that. Uh but you think you think about the the match he had with Ultimate Warrior, probably the best match of his career. Mm-hmm. He laid down uh, he had a match with Arn Anderson that was really good. He laid down. Um, so every time he lost, he was a really good match. If you go back and you think about the match he had with, he had a match, I think at WrestleMania with uh, Macho Man mm-hmm. one year, and it was That's for the awesome. title. And that match sucked. Yeah. It, it sucked bad. And and Macho Man hit him with like five or eight elbow drops. He no sold the elbow. I, I that angered me even when I was young. Yeah, and I didn't know what no selling was, and I didn't know it was scripted at the time. But that angered me. Yeah, <laughs> I'm like, I, I me too. I'm watching it on Scramble Vision because my parents would never let me get the pay per views. Uh, so I'm watching it on Scramble Vision, and it's like one after another after another. Hogan kicks out, hulks up, a couple punches, a boot, and leg drop of doom, and wins. I was so pissed. Yeah, Hogan. Uh... Hogan, there would just like there would be no wrestling without Vince. There would be no wrestling to today in its modern form without Hulk Hogan. I appreciate everything he did done for the business, but yeah, he is uh, one of those people that I like don't get. Yeah, he he was a he was a, a bad worker because he he would only he could work he could do a good job when he wanted to and the vast majority of time I don't think he did plus it from all accounts we can tell he's an asshole of a person so yeah. a complete just piece of crap so uh and he you know mean, he believes he gave his gimmick he believes he's the greatest wrestler of all time and it's just, he wasn't even, he was never the greatest wrestler in his generation he was yeah if you if you're going to do like a a Mount Rushmore of the overall biggest and most important wrestlers in history, he's on it. Yeah. You can't deny that. Uh, but as far as wrestling, as far as in-ring work, wrestling ability, he wasn't even in the top 20 of his era. No. You, you go back to the 80s, you had... God, he, I mean, he couldn't hold a candle to someone like Haku. Macho Man, Ricky Steamboat. Oh. I mean, yeah. just like the, the uh, Jake Roberts, the amount of great wrestlers that were on. Flair. Yeah. I yeah. mean, I mean, like when I was young, Flair was the champion and Hogan was the other champion. Yep. And that that moment when Flair when when Flair showed up on WWE TV and and Bobby Heenan had the big gold belt. Oh, yeah. Crossing thought, the streams. I, I that thought was it was stuff. building. I thought that was building to Hogan and Flair at WrestleMania. Of course, yeah. So many missed opportunities yeah. for that. But um, real quick, before we get out of here, uh, TNA. What's going on with TNA? TNA. Um, uh, the Smashing Pumpkin has got Billy Corbin. It looks like he's buying TNA. I think that's the ultimate goal here. That's why they made him the president of the company. And um, they're they're building, they're trying to build EC3 as their number one face and Bobby Lashley as their number one heel they did this press conference where it uh, turned into a brawl type thing. It looked horrible. Uh, it just looked <laughs> it looked it looked bad. It looked really cheesy, and you could just tell everybody that was at the press conference was a TNA employee. 
And when they started fighting, no one went to stop it. No security, no anything. So it came off very scripted that way, uh, which it was, of course, but it, it, it was supposed to be spontaneous. And it just came out as a scripted fight, like a backroom brawl. The delete or decay thing, uh, and like I said, I'm just hitting on the big parts. The leader decay with Matt Hardy, Jeff Hardy, it is completely different uh, than anything I've ever saw. It's like they took Lucha Underground and what Lucha Underground with their back statements and turned it up uh, to like 20 uh, because it's like they have the fireworks and the fighting and Jeff Hardy is fighting crazy Steve underwater and he looks like he's drowning him. And at the end, the big payoff was that Abyss Abyss was um, swinging Janice at Matt Hardy and uh, Jeff took uh, Jeff took the um, shot for him with uh, Janice. And Jeff is now uh, Brother Nero. That's his character right now. And it's it's all cool. I'm hoping it pays off at the Bound for Glory pay per view with uh, the Hardys beating um, beating Decay for the titles. I think that's the ultimate payoff. But the missed the missed opportunity on TNA right now is the X Division. Uh, they're trying to bring it back, but what it was was the best wrestlers in the world. And I think everyone that the cruiserweight WWE can't keep from the cruiserweight division. X, you know they should sign for the X division because right now I wouldn't take any of those people over anybody in the CWC. Like I would take all thirty-two people in CWC before I put anybody from TNA as oh, a man. to type of lightweight. I think they're all just blah. Yeah. And uh, so that's a big thing, but the. The whole thing with EC3 and Bobby Lashley, I know I'm going backtracking here, but the whole thing with them is neither one are very good wrestlers. So they're about to put on a, they're supposed to put on an amazing match. And See, I, I don't I mind don't, EC3. I think he, he, as uh, he, he can, I mean, EC3, Ethan Carter III, one of my favorite personalities in wrestling. I, I really, I mean, he, I think he, yeah, he's, top. He's right there as far as my favorite person outside of WWE. But his in-ring work is sloppy at best. That's fair. And to, to be fair, I haven't seen a whole lot of his matches. I don't... Yeah, if you if you watch it, I mean, yeah. he he They're not good. Okay. But he gets over on the mic. That's his thing. But the thing is, is when you have Bobby Lashley, someone big that needs a strong person to work with him, to have a great match, and then you have EC3 that also needs a strong person to work with and uh, to get over, and you have them two fighting each other, it's just going to make for a very... Unless you have a lot of run-ins, it's not going to be a good match. But um, TNA is getting better. Uh, they've introduced... This is my last point about them, an Impact Grand Champion, which is more like the MMA rules. It's three... Uh, it's three three-minute rounds. Okay. And you have three judges... 10-9 scoring or 10 point scoring and if neither one gets a pinfall submission it goes to the judge and only thing is from they did it the first week I'd like them to work a little stiffer because if it's you're trying to go with the MMA feel of it you you need to be pretty stiff you know what I'm saying it yeah. needs to be a lot more ground and pound and a lot more I mean honestly I would like to see someone come out of the match with a black eye because just because you're trying to lean towards more to the MMA side of it. Yeah, I I've, I've tried it's, watching TNA. I really have. I hate the ring. I hate the six-sided ring with a fiery passion. I liked it when people knew what to do with it and knew how to use it. Now I now, now it's six-sided, but they really work it like it's a four-sided ring. So yeah, they just need they need to go back to a four-sided ring. Also, I hate the name. The name TNA is awful. That just screams fourteen-year-old dick and fart jokes. It's yeah. it, it's it's Jeff Jarrett's an idiot. Let's just be honest. I, I don't like him either. Uh, and that you can tell that's one of those stupid names. I mean, he came up with slap nuts for God's sake. So let's call my company TNA. So Billy Corgan needs to rebrand the whole thing. And well, I, they tried to rebrand it to Impact Wrestling. Yeah, and they, they, they did, and it didn't work. It just didn't work. 
I mean, people didn't know what to look for. What they need to do is close shop and then reopen as a different company. And let's strip all the belts, start over. Because they've got some great people. Uh, the fact that they they were able to sign Mike Bennett. And when I heard about that, I'm like, Mike, but why the fuck are you signing with TNA, son? You because are Marie, uh, Because the Bellas and Maria Canellas hate each other. Oh, okay. There you go. There, so then. he didn't have a WWE as an option. Because he's really good. I would... I at first I hated him and and Matt Taven as a team, and then the more I watched them, the more I loved them. They were I loved the Kingdom, uh, in Ring of Honor, and uh, and so yeah when when Bennett left, and he showed up in TNA, I was like, what the hell? I mean the Moose thing kind of made sense in the fact that he was about to get a WWE contract, and then they found out he had some domestic. Uh, abuse charges in his past and they're like we can't handle that right now and so that made sense um damien sandow going there makes perfect sense um so and, and uh, drew galloway who going there but he's he's everywhere that he can go um so that stuff makes sense but i was like mike bennett's a guy who's should be on the rise and not no offense to to damien sandow or aaron rex who is a guy who's just who's going to try to show the WWE that he actually had something and they just squandered it. Um, so he was coming from a place of, I need to prove myself, kind of like Galloway, whereas Bennett's coming up through the indies. And you don't necessarily... I mean, granted, it's changed now, now that Bobby Roode, Austin Aries, Samoa Joe, and AJ Styles are all successful in WWE in one form or another. The, the the TNA stink isn't what it was, but it just... I'd still... But now knowing the Marie Canell thing, I hadn't put two and two together with that. Uh, so, so yeah. And, and yeah, they, he didn't have the option. That, and that, that's he, sad. Because he's really well, good. They're, they are a package deal. They, I mean, they are very much open about that, that they are a package deal. And, yeah, Maria was very outspoken about how much she didn't like the Bellas and how it looked like she was coming back to the WWE and they blocked her coming back. And I don't think that's going to go away anytime soon. Which sucks. Because I think those two in WWE together could be gold. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I think uh, I think that's going to about do it because no, neither one of us were able to watch Lucha Underground. And... Uh, I haven't really seen much of season two. I was just going to start watching season three as uh, all my, my regular, the, the season of TV is about to start back up. So I got all my comic book shows I got to follow and it's going to get real busy for me watching the tube. So I have to, I have to, you know, pick carefully what I'm going to watch and what I'm not. Yeah. I was going to say Lucha Underground are probably not going to be something I watch doing the regular TV season because I watched something like 25 shows. Good God, I thought I watched a lot. Damn. Well, I, I'm not married and I don't have kids. If you ever ever have a question about my time or my <laughs> financial situation, just remember that those two facts. Okay, fair <laughs> enough, fair enough. So, hey, so Floyd, where can people reach you online if they want to find you and talk to you or yes, anything like that? Yes, on Twitter, I'm Floyd Johnson Jr., and on Facebook, I'm Floyd Johnson Jr. All I right. pretty much like my name, so I stick. Right. Awesome, awesome. And you guys, you can find the show on uh, Twitter and Facebook at uh, Around the Ring OK. And uh, we will get, uh, we'll be doing this from now on, on Sundays when the show drops. And so next week we'll talk about Backlash. We'll talk about the Cruiserweight Classic Finals, which I'm probably looking forward to a little more than Backlash. Uh, actually, a lot more, really, because uh, I'm really curious what other matches they're going to have. We know that Gargano and Ciampa are going to have a tag team match against somebody, but mm. oh, it's so just so looking forward to that. And uh, are they still going to have an episode of NXT, or are they preempting NXT? I think they're preempting NXT, but we'll see. we'll see. I think no, yeah, I think they're preempting it. Okay, I think it's from seven to nine. Seven to nine. All right, well. Thank you, sir, for joining the show. It's made it so much better. This two and a half hours just flew by. And uh, we will see you guys next week. Take care, everybody. All right. You've been listening to Around the Ring on the Spark Radio Network. All you have to do is change your point of view. And you
Bone Reed. Austin 316 says I just whipped your ass. Bam! Woo! That sucks more than anything that I've ever fucked before. What? It's the charity.